So good morning, everybody, and welcome to this year's Autumn Gathering. It is my great pleasure to host this webinar today, and we have some fantastic speakers lined up for you, as always. Whether you're a regular, a new Scottish member, or perhaps dropping in from further afield, we are delighted that you can join us today. I usually start these webinars by saying how sad it is that we can't be together in person, although it's great that technology still allows us to have a meeting. Hopefully I'll be saying it for the last time today as life steadily begins to return to normal. I'm sure that in the non too distant future, we'll be able to chat over a Battle Beat lunch again. Last 18 months have been incredibly challenging for us as a charity and as individuals. I'm sure that many of us are feeling a bit fatigued and burnt out. However, our Scottish staff have been hard at work behind the scenes, as always, and so I wanted to share with you some snippets of good news. Although we're waiting for written confirmation, Peatland Action are happy for us to announce today that our hugely popular Bog Squad have been awarded funding for two and a half years. This is big news for us because previously we've only ever been allowed to apply for one year at a time. The new funding will allow us to hire a part-time project officer and hold around 60 work parties to help improve the condition of our peatlands. We'll also produce a peat-free gardening leaflet and undertake a national large heath survey. Tom Prescott has asked me to thank our funders, Nature Scott and Peatland Action for their generous support. And I would like to thank Tom and the rest of the team for all of their hard work because I know just how time consuming and how much effort goes into these funding applications. So congratulations from me. In other news, Anthony's Helping Hands for Butterflies project is continuing to engage public, the public in meadow creation. It has also resulted in more than 50 new transect volunteers, which ensures that we can better monitor Scotland's declining butterfly species. Butterfly Conservation have also embarked on an important new collaboration with Plant Life and the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. This new project is called Grasslands Plus, which aims to highlight just how essential grasslands are in capturing carbon and protecting biodiversity. This campaign asks you to stand up for grasslands by contacting your MP using the link on the screen. All of these projects, Bog Squad, Helping Hands and Grassland Plus demonstrate butterfly conservation's commitment to the fight against climate change and we aim to send out a clear message in the run-up to COP26. Something else you might have noticed from the programme is that BC have been working hard to create a new strategy document. This is the product of many weeks hard work by trustees and in collaboration with the senior leadership team. I won't give away too many details because Di is going to be talking about this a bit later, but I do want to express my excitement that I felt when I was presented with the final product of all of this work. For the first time, I felt, wow, BC has finally found its voice and is ready to confidently stand up as the UK's leading authority on Lepidoptera. For the first time, we are seriously talking about the big issues of our time. We are defiantly taking a stand against the climate and biodiversity crisis. We are acknowledging that as a charity, we need to do more to promote and improve the diversity and equality of our membership, staff and board. As a young person, I really felt that the new strategy was speaking to me. And of course, we are more committed to butterflies and moths than ever before. Unfortunately, after those positive announcements, I have two less enjoyable items to report. And the first is that our wonderful Scott Shanks has very sadly decided to step down as chair and committee member from Southwest Branch. Scott has been an excellent chair and asset to butterfly conservation generally. He is a positive force for good and a passionate communicator. I know I love seeing Scott's tweets in my newsfeed which are usually promoting wonderful conservation projects and outreach activities that he's been involved with. On behalf of the Scottish team, I'd like to thank Scott for all of his hard work 
And although we're very sorry to lose you, Scott, we hope you have more free time to enjoy outside in nature. Now, it's with a very heavy heart that I have to announce um, another piece of very, very sad news, the unexpected and tragic loss of our friend and colleague, Douglas Boyce. Doug was a very young and exceptionally talented lepidopterist. And although he wasn't a Scottish member, I've no doubt that many of you will be familiar with his fantastic work and will have perhaps interacted with Doug on social media as well. Doug was a rising star in butterfly conservation and entomology generally. His local branch in South Wales bought him his first moth trap at age 13, and by age 16, he had become BC's youngest ever county butterfly recorder. He was tireless in his recording and outreach efforts and has significantly contributed to moth recording in the UK. Doug went on to receive a first class honours degree during which he researched the fascinating world of micromoths in birds' nests. Later, he received a master's with distinction and continued his research into declining moth populations. More recently, and perhaps his best known work, was his PhD into the harmful effects of LED street lighting on moths, which produced the first real world evidence that light pollution is reducing moth populations. When he published this research just a few weeks ago, it was met with huge media interest across the world. I had the pleasure of getting to know Doug well several years ago when Butterfly Conservation Europe sent us both on an Erasmus trip to Turkey. Back then he was only about 21, but his identification skills were already exceptional. He was a kind friend, quick-witted, always impeccably dressed and extremely generous with his time. He was always happy to support others and share his knowledge. When we unexpectedly lose a friend and especially somebody so young, it can be very difficult to process. All we can do is remember Douglas's hard work and contribution to Lepidoptera and be inspired to continue his excellent work. On behalf of Butterfly Conservation Scotland, I want to thank Douglas for his unswerving dedication and to send our condolences to his loved ones during this very difficult time. Following on from that very sad news, I think I'll just end by suggesting that now might be a very poignant time to reflect on the strong community spirit of Butterfly Conservation Scotland. We are a group of people united by a common cause we are passionate about protecting butterflies and moths. My hope for the coming year is that as things start to gear back up again post pandemic, you will join me in taking full advantage of all the new opportunities on offer, some of which will be advertised today. I hope that you get out with us for a conservation work party or perhaps join us in an identification workshop. I hope that you'll have a great time catching up with old friends and perhaps make some new ones as well. If you are new, I hope you always feel that you can reach out to us because there's always somebody friendly waiting to help you. And for the old timers amongst us, I hope you are generous with your knowledge like Douglas was and that you're ready to help new members feel as welcome as possible. And on that note, I'm going to wrap up and introduce our first speaker of the day. So, Dr. Martin Warren will be a familiar face to most of us as the previous Chief Exec of Butterfly Conservation and staff member for more than 20 years. I'm very glad that we haven't seen the last of you, Martin, as since stepping down as CEO, you've been very busy writing a fantastic book, uh, which I enjoyed very much. I read uh, in your introduction that you wanted to write a book that you wish you'd had when you started butterflying and what a gem it is. So I'll hand over to you. I'm sure you're going to tell us more about it. Thank you, Epiphany, and welcome to everyone. So um, anyway, I'm very sorry I can't be there in person with you, but um, I've met many of you, so um, welcome and uh, thank you for joining in. So 
my talk is going to cover what some what I consider to be some amazing recent discoveries about the lives of butterflies, the secret lives of butterflies that we didn't know much about before this amazing research that's been published mostly in the last five to ten years. So I picked out from uh, uh, writing this book about butterflies some of the things that I kind of half knew but uh, didn't really realise quite how amazing butterflies were until I kind of delved into the research. Uh, nothing to do with conservation particularly, but um, hopefully some of it will be relevant to the work that butterfly conservation does. So there are six secrets I'm going to cover. Um, and the first one is really something that I vaguely knew, but um, has really been understood a lot more in recent years, which is the actual origin of butterflies in evolution. And the, the first secret is, is that uh, actually they did fly over the heads of dinosaurs. So they evolved that long ago that they uh, were around at the time of the dinosaurs. So I'm just going to my, um, I'm just moving a screen off. Okay, now I can see. Um, so um, finding out about how butterflies evolved is actually a massive detective story and uh, some very clever people have been working on it, and I'm just reporting on some of their work. So a lot of what we know about, of course, the history of animals on, on the planet is through fossils. And amazingly, some butterflies have been fossilized. You'd think with their fragile wings, they wouldn't get fossilized very easily. But here's one, which is actually um, from the Isle of Wight, and it's three centimeters across. Um, it's 34 million years old, so that's pretty old. So that's the end of the Eocene when primates were first coming about. It's actually, we know enough about it that it, we know that it was related to the Duke of Burgundy. It's probably in that family of Riodinidae. And it's even got a name called Lithopsyche antiqua, an ancient stone butterfly. Not very original, I think, but uh, still, and you can still see the patterns on the wings, which I think is just quite extraordinary. There's an even older fossil butterfly, which comes from America, um, and that's 35 million years ago, and it's a relative of the Red Admiral. But of course, these are just fossils, and they're very rare fossil butterflies, um, and the rest of our information has come from other discoveries. Now, one of the most amazing discoveries, I feel, is this um, recent discovery from um, work that was done when some um, German researchers were looking at, um, they were looking at the pollen grains in sediments in mud in the bottom of a lake in Germany. But when they were looking through the specimens, they came across these scales and they immediately recognised that they were scales of Lepidoptera scale wing butterflies and moths um, and then they dated them and they dated these scales to 200 million years ago so this is the end of the triassic when the first dinosaurs started coming about so this pushed the origin of lepidoptera back quite a long way from what we knew from fossils so that's 200 million years ago and they even know that these scales came from a group of butterflies uh, that relate to the family Glossata that we have today. <clears throat> but the, perhaps the most remarkable piece of work that's been done, which I can't explain properly because it's quite complicated and I don't have the time, but um, it was done by this amazing um, American scientist called Akito Kawahara. And if you want to read this paper, it's really very interesting. <clears throat> and what he's done is he's used molecular DNA so that's the DNA that's within the cells of the uh, specimens that he can get hold of, of Lepidoptera. And what he did was he looked back here at this rather complicated um, diagram. On the left, it's the evolution of the flowering plants, and on the right, the evolution of Lepidoptera. And basically, what in the center of the um, chart here, this is the oldest origin of these groups of plants and animals here. <clears throat> and basically through looking at the DNA and backtracking, you can look at how the, the groups of plants and animals have evolved over time. 
It's a remarkable piece of research. But what it's done is it's actually pushed back the origin of Lepidoptera way before flowering plants back to 300 million years ago. So this is back in the Permian times. Uh, and this is when the first reptiles before dinosaurs, before the, when the first reptiles crawled out onto earth, onto land and began to evolve. <clears throat> And moths were around then, way before the, the start of flowering plants. The butterflies, he found, came later, about 100 million years ago. So moths have been around for 200 million years before butterflies came around. And as many of you know, butterflies are just a small subset of the order Lepidoptera. Um, so they came about way before the um, time of the dinosaurs. The moths did, um, but butterflies overlapped with the dinosaurs, which died out about 60, 70 million years ago. So we can have the thought when we look at butterflies that their ancestors were flying around with the dinosaurs, which I think is a, a rather lovely thought. So my next <coughs> secret, which is delving into the lives of butterflies and their mating habitat habits. Um, and I've titled this No Such Thing as a Glamorous Butterfly because it's an odd thing that we think butterflies are glamorous and they're beautiful and they're probably beautiful to attract mates, but the real reality is actually rather different. Now, our knowledge of, sort of bright colours in animals often is very influenced by the colours in birds. And it actually fooled Darwin for quite a long while, this, why butterflies were so brightly coloured. And he assumed, like many people, that they were brightly coloured to attract mates, like birds do. So here we have the peacock with its incredible um, tail feathers. They're designed to attract the female. The female, they do this dance, they show their feathers, and the females come along and they mate. And that's how it works in the bird world, by and large. But for butterflies, it's rather different. And for many butterflies, the males and the females, for a start, are the same colour. So here we have silver wash artillery, male on the left, female on the right, very look, similar looking colours. So you can't imagine immediately that the females are then looking for a similarly coloured um, butterfly because they might be a female. So something else must be going on. Now, of course, we know that there's a few species like the common blue, which do have different colored um, males and females, uh, and the males are generally more brightly colored. So you can see why people might have thought that the bright colors were there to attract females. But in fact, with butterflies, uh, it's the males that seek the females, not the other way around. So um, the males spend most of their lives cruising around looking for females and the females are rather drab. So they're quite difficult to spot, um, uh, particularly like, for example, in the common blue. So that's quite different from bird mating. And she just tends to hang around and wait for the males to find her. And it's rare that the females actually seek the males. Um, and if they do, they tend to just go to places where they might find males or the males might find them. And probably you're aware of this, that the butterflies have several strategies of how to find females. Um, the most common is the patrollers, which are things like the White Admiral, which just cruise around the countryside into, in favourite places looking for females. And then there are perchers, like the Duke of Burgundy here, which are territorial. They set up a territory in a nice place where they think females will come along and then they'll investigate um, anything that looks like a Duke of Burgundy that comes into their space. So they're the two main strategies that males adopt to find females. And when they get close to the, uh, something that might be a candidate to, for a mate, it's then all about smell. So this is quite different from birds where it's all about sight. Uh, for um, butterflies, it's all about smell. And this is a, a drawing from... Uh, by Richard Lewington of the amazing sort of mating um, courtship ritual of the um, silver wash artillery where the male does the loop-de-loop -loop below the female 
And what it does when it's doing that is it's releasing pheromones from these androconial scales on the forewing. So these are the stripy scales on the forewing of the male. And here's a close up picture of them. And as they're doing this loop to loop, they shower the female with uh, pheromones so that she knows it's a male silver wash artillery. So if I land a mate with this individual, then the chances are I'll pass my genes on to the right species and uh, this mating will be successful. And <clears throat> some butterflies, actually, you can smell them. Uh, so if you catch a male um, green veined white, for example, you can smell the male scent, which is a um, very strong smell of lemons. Um, and that's really quite a fascinating story in itself, the whole smell complex of green veined whites. So why do males have this bright colour, at least in some species? <clears throat> well, the, the answer seems to be, and there's been very little research done on this, partly because it's quite complicated to do it. But one of the reasons, or the main reason it's thought, is that males are brightly coloured to ward off other males, i.e. competitors, who might be moving into their space. So those of you that have watched territorial butterflies, you know, for example, Duke Burgundy or Green Hair Streak or something like that, you, a speckled wood, you know they chase off intruders. And the colour seems to be one of the things that triggers them to chase them off. So the bright colours of the males are probably to do with actually warding off other males rather than attracting females. But like every rule in life, there's our exceptions. And this again is not well known, but um, not well researched, but there are um, some butterflies which have um, colors that we can't see. So butterflies can see into the ultraviolet and they, the butterflies like the brimstone and the clouded yellow, if you look at them in ultraviolet, they have these very bright, shiny patches which reflect ultraviolet. And the females can see these. And it's one of the ways that the females can tell the males of the right species. Uh, so the different clouded yellows have different patterns, although they look rather similar to us. And it looks possible that actually the females are attracted to these uh, brightly colored ultraviolet. But again, I say it's not, not that well researched. So the story of this, uh, the conclusion of this uh, is that butterflies are glamorous, some of them, the humans can't see it. And for most of them, they're not glamorous in the sense that they're attracting members of the opposite, opposite sex. They're doing it to ward off other competitors. So that was a secret that I didn't know so much about, um, but uh, is explained in my book uh, uh, about how this complicated system works. Now, the other thing that <clears throat> if you go on with the bait it, butterfly dating game is that um, they are very devious lovers, butterflies, and there's a lot of complexity going on uh, between the two sexes as they seek out mates and as they actually mate. So here's two wood whites doing their amazing courtship ritual where the male waves its antennae and proboscis over the heads of the female. And they do that as a prelude to, court, to mating. Um, so when they actually do mate, <clears throat> most butterflies only mate once and they transfer what's called a spermatophore across to the female. Now the spermatophore um, is actually up to 15% of the body weight. So it's quite an investment in the, from the male to the female. And it contains not only sperm to fertilize the eggs, but also nutrients to actually enable the eggs to grow. And that's quite critical for species like the wood white, which have very thin bodies, which not enough nutrients to produce very many eggs. But once they get mated, they get all those nutrients from the male and they can produce more eggs as a result. So that's quite a critical thing to know is that this spermatophore is not just sperm. It's, it's actually this package of nutrients. Now, as I said, most butterflies are, are single maters, but species like the green veined white can actually mate up to six times. And the female at each mating acquires nutrients to lay more eggs. So for her, her aim is to mate more than once so she can maximize her egg production with her genes. So she 
quite often mates two or three times um, in her lifetime, acquiring nutrients and sperm from different males. Now the male obviously has a slightly different view on life because by mating, he, he loses 15% of his body weight and he can't mate again for several days. Um, so he has to get more nutrients. So he has to feed up in order to have another go at passing on his genes. So he, for him, if the female mates again, then he loses that competitive, competitive edge because other male sperm will be in the female as well. So he will rather the female didn't mate again. So they have very different views on life about the number of matings. Now this has been looked at in the, in the Glanville Fertillery um, and some people in um, uh, Finland have done some research on this and looked at the first matings of Glanville Fertilleries um, which last an average of one hour, 18 minutes. Now, the first, the, the first, the spermatophore is passed in the first 30 minutes. And the rest of that time, the male is just hanging on, playing for time. And what he's doing is he leaving, he's leaving an anti-aphrodisiac pheromone in the female, which actually means that she's less likely to mate afterwards. So that what he so he's playing a game here that he's actually putting some smells in her that actually make her not want to mate again so that her eggs are his eggs as well. Now if they mate again, which they do occasionally, um, the second mating lasts even longer, three hours and a half, and that's because the male really doesn't want her to lay mate again and so he's hanging on so that she has less time to mate again and so her business after that will be to lay eggs and maximize her reproductive potential. So you can see that males and females have slightly different uh, views on the whole mating process. Sorry and uh, so when you see butterflies mating uh, there's quite a lot going on there both in the chemical world uh, and the in the physical world as well. So my next uh, secret is about the miracle of migration. And again, more research in recent years has really pushed our understanding of this no end. And I'm gonna focus here on the migration of the um, painted lady because that's the one that's most well known. And of course, it's the most famous one, I think, for most of us. So um, I think we all knew for many years that they came from Africa um, and they spread from North Africa up through the continent during um, uh, the summer months, reaching Britain and right up into Northern Europe um, in, in the summer. So that was a migration of about 2,500 miles. So it's a long migration even then. But recent research looking at some very clever um, analysis of the chemicals of these butterflies has really changed our understanding of this quite a lot. And this work by Gerard Talavera and his colleagues um, just recently, 2019, they looked at um, eight stable isotopes in these butterflies, which actually show that the origin of where these butterflies were actually raised and, and reared as caterpillars. And it's quite complicated, this figure, but there's basically six groups of butterflies that they sampled in different parts of Europe and they looked at the isotopes within them to see where those butterflies had come from in Africa. So it's a very clever piece of research looking at these stable isotopes. So this group here, they came from mainly East Africa here. This group came from South of the Sahara here. This group, South of the Sahara as well. This group, both from North Africa and South of the Sahara and so on. And this group here, they came from Europe. So different things going on in different groups of, of butterflies that they sampled. But the big discovery they made was that some of them were coming from um, south of the Sahara, which pushed their migration a lot further than we knew um, previously. So this is one I think is going on. And I've checked this with some of the authors and they, they, they agree that this is kind of what's going on. So basically in the winter, January and February, Painted ladies are breeding in North Africa. They're also breeding south of the Sahara. And some of those butterflies migrate up to North Africa in that period. Then in March and April, 
and they spread into southern Europe and then in the summer they move up into northern Europe and that's when we find them usually from May to June onwards. July and August they're breeding um, in northern Europe and then they start setting off back um, to southern to back back to Africa in September and October and then some of them migrate further down still back down to um, the South Sahara um, in November and December. So they have this enormously long migration route, which is actually a 7,500 miles round trip each year for that group of butterflies. But it's several generations, they're not one individual doing all this, it's several generations that do it throughout the summer. And that's one of the records, it's not actually the record in the insect world, there's a dragonfly that flies a little bit further, but um, it's certainly the record, in, as we know, in the butterfly world, beating the most famous one of all, the monarch butterfly in America. Now, my fifth secret is actually the secret of survival of the butterfly itself and its caterpillars and its eggs. And um, as we probably know, butterflies and their caterpillars are eaten by all sorts of things. And so here's some examples of uh, um, a, a bird eating a butterfly, uh, these beetles eat butterflies and parasites um, kill butterflies as well. So they're running a gauntlet right from the moment they're laid as an egg of a gauntlet of survival. And again, our knowledge of this has just come on leaps and bounds in recent years. So you have to think about it that if a female butterfly lays 100 eggs and half are females, they all mate and they lay eggs again, and the same thing happens. 10 years later, oh, sorry, 10 years later, you get that many butterflies. So the powers of reproduction are quite vast in butterflies. And um, without these predators and parasites, we actually would be knee deep in butterflies and they'd eat all their food plant. So in a way, these predators, although we don't like to think of them killing our lovely butterflies, um, they're actually doing the ecosystem a favour because they're controlling the numbers of these species which would otherwise defoliate their food plants and die out anyway. So um, the powers of reproduction are huge. So what happens to the butterflies when they start laying eggs? So in the woodwhite, which is a species that I studied as for my PhD, um, if you imagine a hundred eggs being laid, this is the how many of those eggs survive at different stages through the larval life cycle and as pupae and as adults. So from every hundred eggs that are laid, five adults emerge. And you can see there's mortality in every stage of the life cycle, even down into the pupil stage here. So on average, um, there's 95% mortality between um, eggs and adults. And there's things eating them, all different things, all the way through this life cycle. Now, to begin with, the young caterpillars tend to be eaten by other invertebrates. So whether it's spiders, beetles, and so on. And when they get bigger, they get more attractive for birds. And birds eat the, then the majority of the older caterpillars, uh, whereas the younger caterpillars tend to be eaten by invertebrate species. <clears throat> And I mentioned parasites, and we all know that parasites kill a large number of butterfly uh, larvae. And here's a picture of a um, parasite called Cartesia glomerata injecting eggs into the large white. And um, they inject, as you can see, into tiny little caterpillars. How they find them is quite a phenomenal story in itself, which I can't go into here. Um, but uh, they do find them and it's uh, an absolute miracle and they inject their eggs straight into those caterpillars and the developing parasite develops inside the caterpillar as it grows. And they can, in the case of the large white, this species kill over 60% of the larvae. So a very high mortality inflicted by um, this particular parasite. There are some really cunning egg parasites. So these are tiny little flies. Now it's, um, well, actually this is a wasp species, but it's a tiny thing called Trichogramma evanescens. It's tiny, you can see here, these are the eggs of the large white, which it um, parasitizes. And 
several of them can live with inside just one egg. So it just gives you an idea how tiny they are. And there's some fabulous work by Nina Fatoris on this, butter, on this um, parasite. And she found that the actual parasite hitches a lift on the adults. As they emerge, they climb up onto the emerging adult and they stick on the adult until she lays eggs. And then, of course, she's got her immediate prey let right underneath her then. So they hitch a lift on the um, uh, adult female butterflies and then they can, their job of finding the eggs to parasitize is much easier. And we all know about marsh artilleries uh, and how um, they live in these big groups of caterpillars, which makes them very susceptible to parasites. And they get parasitized by um, a specific parasite, which is called Cortesia bignelliae, um, which causes even bigger mortalities and can kill 80% of all the caterpillars that, it, of, of, that uh, occur in the wild. Um, so it, it, they can cause, they're one of the reasons why marsh artilleries um, go through these big fluctuations in abundance. Some years these parasites kill more and some yet less, um, and that often dictates the number of adults that you see. But the story of the parasites goes on. So here's a little step flaying. Big fleas are, uh, have little fleas upon their backs to bite them, and little fleas have even lesser fleas, and so ad infinitum. Um, and that phrase is really true in nature, uh, that there's always something else eating something else. So the complex food webs of the world of parasites is really um, a fascinating study. So here's a picture of a parasite um, by some Dutch researchers. And you think, oh, OK, this is a parasite injecting this poor old caterpillar, which happens to be a glandular artillery caterpillar. But actually, no, this is actually a thing called Mesochorus stigmaticus, which is a hyperparasite, which is actually stinging not the caterpillar itself, but the parasite that's already in that caterpillar. So this hyperparasite has an even more incredible life cycle because it can find not only the caterpillars of the um, gland artillery, but also detect whether they've got a parasite within them because it's not interested in parasitizing the caterpillar, but the parasite which is actually growing within that caterpillar. So it's amazing abilities to detect that. So um, in the world of butterflies in the, in the UK, um, there are some species of parasite which are specific. So the marsh artillery parasite is specific just to that species. And so is this um, amazing wasp that parasitizes the swallowtail. And in, as part of doing the book, I, I worked with some um, of the parasite experts at the Natural History Museum and also the Museum of Scotland and Mark Shaw uh, to actually list for the first time the actual number of parasite species that were, had been recorded in UK butterflies. And it's about 70 species of parasite and an unknown number of egg parasites because they are so small that people haven't really studied them very much and the genetics of them is quite complicated. There's probably many, many species involved. And goodness knows how many hyperparasites, because again, uh, there are very few people that can identify these and um, uh, they, their life cycles are not really well known. But it's an amazing story. And when you see these um, parasites, it, you have to have this sort of cunning, um, the appreciation of their cunning and their ability to find their prey and um, their life cycles, which are just as complex, if not more so than the butterfly themselves. Right, this is my last um, uh, secret of butterflies. Um, and that is, in fact, their genetically modified organisms. And when I read this piece of research, I had to read it and reread it and reread it because it is quite complicated and I'm not going to give it justice here because um, I don't fully understand it myself. Um, but uh, if you want to, you can read this amazing paper that I've got referenced at the bottom there. Um, and the work was done in um, the black swallowtail, which is a butterfly that flies in America. 
and it has this amazing, beautiful parasite. And <clears throat> the story goes like this. So when the parasite injects the um, caterpillar or the, in this case, the chrysalis, um, it injects uh, uh, some uh, viruses called brachoviruses, which are a specific group of virus, um, along with its eggs. And those viruses grow inside the chrysalis along with the parasite. And what these viruses do is they actually block the butterfly's immune system, which otherwise would actually try and um, kill the parasite, this invader that's come into it. Um, and I guess in times of COVID, we're all familiar with viruses and how they work and how the immune system tries to fight them off. Um, and that's what's happening here. But the, 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 the reason why the parasite quite happy to have the viruses along is that the viruses block the butterfly's immune system and allow the parasite to survive. But occasionally the caterpillars survive this onslaught of, of the um, parasite. And sometimes the virus genes get inserted into the butterfly's genome. And this is a little known um, uh, phenomenon that has been researched and it happens actually in quite a number of other organisms. And it's uh, a process called horizontal uh, gene transfer. So whereby it's a little bit of the giant virus genome gets inserted into the butterfly's genome. And if that butterfly then survives, it actually has an amazing advantage because the actual inserted gene helps protect it from subsequent infections by the virus. So there's a battle going on here between um, the parasite and its uh, uh, viruses, which are uh, originally um, help the parasite, but the butterflies somehow adopting those genes to protect it from future infections or future generations from infections. So it's an incredibly complicated story. But the ultimate thing is, is that actually when you look at a butterfly, it's actually part parasite, a small part, but part parasite. And to me, that's a, just a mind blowing thought that um, this is going on in probably every butterfly because these brachyviruses they found are present in nearly all parasites. So they think this system is quite widespread amongst butterflies and no doubt moths as well, um, and possibly lots of other insects as well. So it's extraordinary to me that to think that these genes from viruses are getting into the genomes of um, lots of other organisms, but that seems to be happening. Uh, so that's um, a little delve, deep dive into some of the secrets going on when you look at a butterfly and you think, wow, that's a fabulous butterfly. Uh, and next time you see one, just have a think how it came, where it came from, that tiny egg that developed to run that gauntlet of predators. Um, how it evolved all those years back in time with dinosaurs, uh, how it perfected its colouring and mating rituals and uh, egg production, um, mating strategies, all those things. And then in the end, even acquired genes from viruses to help it survive. So they're tough little beasts, they look fragile, but they're really quite good survivors, despite all the onslaught that human beings are trying to give them now. In the history of, of evolution, they're quite tough little things that have survived all those years using this complicated, um, amazing stories to help them survive. So thank you very much for listening. And thank you particularly to the photographers who I um, who provided all the photos uh, for this presentation. Um, and of course, the researchers for their absolutely extraordinary work delving into the secret lives of butterflies. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Martin, for that fascinating talk, um, especially the section on, on parasites. I find that so interesting. A few years ago, we actually had a talk from uh, Mark Shaw in East Branch, and he showed us some amazing images, uh, high magnification images of the ovipositors of parasitic wasps. And they were all different, interesting shapes, and it was just fascinating. So yeah, great to include that in your talk. I'm just going to open the Q&A box now and see what's there. Okay, so we have a question from Jim Asher, which says, uh, do you think this type of horizontal gene transfer might drive evolution itself and not just random DNA changes? Good question, Jim. <laughs> As I said, I'm not an expert. It was pretty mind blowing reading all that stuff. Um, and I'm not a geneticist, but I, you can only think it does because anything that gives a butterfly an advantage, a survival advantage, has got to make those genes spread quicker. You know, that's what evolution, how it works. If you've got a competitive edge and your um, offspring are more numerous than other um, individuals in your population, then those genes are going to spread. So those virus genes that confer an advantage have got to be spreading quicker than butterflies that don't have them. So um, yes, I think it, they must do, um, but um, I, I wouldn't be able to give you chapter and verse, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry, that was a really hard question to it pick was, for the first you, one. <laughs> <laughs> I shall remember that. Just keeping you on your toes, Martin. <laughs> So we have another question from Sheila Scobie saying, how much variability is there in the mortality rates between different butterflies? Do some caterpillars have stronger defense mechanisms than others? Well, <clears throat> again, that's a, yes, it's a, it, they, there is quite a lot of variability. So um, the I, off the top of my head, the, the range of egg laying rates for different species varies um, from around sort of 30 or 40 for some um, species per female this is who, ha, who, their, who their survival of their caterpillars is slightly higher uh, than other species but things like the marsh artillery they have to lay about 300 eggs per female because so many of them get killed by the parasites and by other predators as well so there's quite a lot of variation now whether that's because the caterpillars are better at surviving i'm really not 100 percent sure whether it's the caterpillars that, that the reason because the reason i say that is because the survival of an egg depends on so many different things. And it could be where the female places the egg, for example. So if she's just a smart female that places them in places where they don't get so many parasites or so on, then uh, that might be the reason why they survive better. So for example, one of the things that I go into in the book is that the butterflies that fly around in the countryside and lay their eggs widely. So for example, the brimstone is the classic example. So brimstone, you've probably seen them flying around laying eggs. <clears throat> they lay an egg and then they'll fly perhaps a mile before they lay the next one. And that's probably because that's a good way so that parasites can't really home in on them very easily. So they've evolved that, but it's the female doing that rather than the caterpillar being clever at being able to survive the, um, the parasites. So yes, there is variation between um, different species. Um, but it's not just down to the caterpillar defences, which are many and varied. Um, you know, there are some which are spiny, some which are smooth, some which are distasteful, which are, again, I go into in the book, which is a little known phenomenon, but a lot of butterflies are distasteful. Great. Thanks, Martin. Uh, I was wondering if you could give us a brief explanation of what actually stimulates the painted lady migration and how oh. this might relate to parasitism yeah well there is some there is some thought that the power the that what drives the migration i mean there's i say this is the researchers that are doing it in in, in africa and there's a team of people still working on it so it's it'll change i think almost by the year as they find out different things but they think one of the reasons that drives the migration is that parasites do build up in the populations in africa and so there's a selective advantage for the females to move into parasite free areas 
So uh, that's one theory. I mean, of course, in Africa, it's very obvious that their their food plants disappear in the summer in Africa because they get too dry and the, the food plants shrivel up. So they can't stay. Well, if they stayed there, they'd have to effectively hibernate or estivate through that summer period. So there's two factors driving the migration, I think. One is which that if they don't do it, that either the parasites will get them or the drought will get them. So either way, they have two choices. One is to find some way of surviving uh, in situ, which would what is what, of course, most butterflies do in the UK during the winter. They hunker down as an egg or a caterpillar or so on through the winter. They could do that through the summer months in Africa, but obviously they've, in evolution have chosen to or been selected to move rather than stay where they are. Great. We have time for one more question, I think. Um, so I'll take one from Ian, which reads, when the hyperparasite which lays its eggs on the parasite of the glanville fritillary larva, does the larva manage to reach adulthood? And if not, at which stage does it die? Yeah, um, the answer is mostly no, um, they don't survive, the caterpillars. Um, often what happens is that the actual primary parasite emerges, usually at a change of instar of the caterpillar, which is when it's most vulnerable, if you like, and uh, often when they change into a chrysalis, that's often when the caterpillar parasites emerge. So they emerge uh, and it's then that the hyperparasite hatches out of those, um, the grubs of, of the parasite that's just emerged. So that's, I think, tends to be what happens. But uh, as I said, the life cycle of these hyperparasites is really not well known. And um, it's, it's uh, it, well, there's obviously very few people working on it. It's very hard to do, although you can bring these things into the lab to do it. But to work out what happens in the wild is, is next to impossible. Great. Well, thank you very much, Martin. We're going to have to wrap up pleasure. just there. But we might have a bit more time later on for questions. So if anybody does have any more questions for Martin, put them in the Q&A box and I'll, um, I'll take note of them for later. Excellent. So next up, we have... Uh, David Long, who was a research associate pre previously of the Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh and is now a very active BC volunteer in Berwickshire. Uh, I think, David, you're the envy of many mothers in the borders because you have a very interesting species so close to home. So I'm going to hand over now for you to tell us all about it. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'll just try and share my screen. Right, my, the title of my short talk is Clearing News from Berwickshire. Um, my name's David Long, and uh, as Apisani has just said, I'm a botanist by profession, and I'm now retired, but I'm still working as a research associate at the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh, where my main research focus is on Himalayan plants and on bryophytes, that's mosses and liverworts. However, I live down in the borders in Berwickshire, and I take a keen interest in all types of natural history in this area. As far as entomology goes, I'm very much a beginner. Um, and I'm in very exalted company here, I think. Um, however, I got interested in clearings quite by accident when I stumbled upon them literally uh, near my house in the woodland shown here, as I will explain. Just for those who, who may not know the borders very well, Berwickshire is in the, it's the most southeasterly county of Scotland. Um, and where we live is a place called Spottiswood, which is an old estate on the southern edge of the Lammermoor Hills. And we're at about 800 feet, so quite, quite high up. Um, this is the large red belted clearwing, which is the first species I will talk about, Sinanthodon culiciformis, photographed near my house at Spottiswood in May 2018. And this is the first clearwing species I encountered and ever saw um, in 2013. The female shown here has non-feathery antennae to distinguish it from the male 
which has feathery antennae, but is otherwise almost identical. Clear wings, as, as many of you know, or most of you will know, belong to the Lepidopteran family Cessiidae, which are distinctive in their wings, which largely lack scales, and in their remarkable mimicry of other insects. My late father, Albert Long, who lived, also lived in Berwickshire, he was an amateur entomologist for, for many years, but he never saw this species during his whole activity here in the 1950s and 60s. And he knew of only two much older historic records of this species for the county from 1839 and 1902. So it's very, very elusive creature, uh, uh, you know, in general. Now here is our woodland at Spottiswood, and I will describe how I made my first acquaintance with this moth in 2013, and how I've got to know it a little bit better since then. I have a strong interest in ecological restoration of native woodland. I'm very involved with Borders Forest Trust. Um, and by good fortune, we were able to buy 80 acres of ex-forestry commission Sitka spruce plantation right beside our house in 2002, a real stroke of luck. And thanks to a forestry grant at that time, we were able to clear fell, uh, as you see in the top right here, uh, about half of the total area of Sitka spruce, which was quite young at the time, and re replant this area, uh, mostly with oak, sessile oak, and with other native broadleaves. But in the bottom right, you can see that in some uh, parts of our woodland, we had very vigorous uh, natural regeneration of birch. And, and we also had some stands of older birch trees. Now, here's a stand of birch 10 years after we removed the spruce and also after thinning. Um, And thinning has been carried out by the Lothian conservation volunteers who come down from Edinburgh and have done a terrific amount of work to help with our native woodland restoration. Um, in 2013, well, and that's within a decade, we had amazing birch regeneration, so dense that we had to do some thinning. So, and in 2013, on two older birch stumps, uh, as seen on the right, um, I found quite by chance empty pupil cases sticking out from the cut surface uh, where adults had already hatched. I had no idea what these pupae were, but our local moth recorder, Barry Prater, identified these as large red belted clearwing pupae, which was a really quite exciting discovery because at the time there were no other known colonies uh, of this moth in southeast Scotland. So that was a real... Um, a, a real remarkable discovery, and as I said, quite by accident. So, uh, although I did not see an adult clearing for another four years in May 2017, when I did start to understand the life cycle, uh, and I, I missed the opportunities in between, I think. And also at my attempts with the pheromone lure also failed in the first few years. However, I've learned uh, from these mistakes and I've now managed to see and photograph adults every year since then on sunny days in the last week of May and in early June. And more recently, I have now been able to successfully catch males in a trap by means of the, of the pheromone lure developed for this species. So the, this discovery of clear wings led me to attempt to manage some of the birch areas to encourage the species and this activity has been quite successful, I have to say. This involved clear felling some areas, and uh, as you see on the left there, again, thanks to Lothian conservation volunteers, and leaving the stumps exposed, uh, preferably in sunny areas exposed to the south. Um, so <coughs> over the last few years, I've tried to make observations uh, in, in my woodland of the life cycle of the, of the large red belted clearing. And I'm not really, uh, I haven't really sorted up on the literature. So I'm sure most of what I say is well known, but these are my own observations. So I will try and describe the life cycle as I have been able to observe it. Though the one stage I've never seen is an actual larva, a caterpillar. 
because I was very hesitant about opening up one of the stumps, uh, which would be fatal to the larvae. Uh, the life cycle appears to take one year. Here in the A shows the egg laying, an egg laying female. And, and when she's laying, she's totally focused on the task and ignores anyone watching. She moves over the surface of the stump, waving her abdomen to and fro, apparently looking for cracks or crevices in which to lay the egg. B, you can see one of the eggs, which are really tiny, but with practice can actually be quite easily found. But I have not witnessed an egg hatching or the young larvae. Fra D shows frass, sorry, C shows frass, which is extruded upwards and gradually accumulates on the surface of the stump over several months. And, and by the autumn, these piles of frass can really be quite large. Uh, E shows two cocoons, which I removed, sorry, D shows uh, a stump that I cut at the end of the season and took the bark off. And you can see the borings inside the, the tree stump. E shows two cocoons. I'm not sure what these are made of, but these are removed from the same stump you can see at D. Uh, F is an emerging adult, which we just caught this year as it had emerged. Um, with its wings expanding in the sunshine, late morning in the last week of May this year. So you can see there the wings are not fully, fully expanded. And finally, G, the hatched pupa. As the moth prepares to emerge from the, from the stump, it drags the pupal case upwards and out of its burrow. And this case gets left standing around, proud in the process, making it very easy, easy to detect where adults have emerged. So that's as much as I've gleaned uh, over these few years. So one thing I have tried to do is to attempt to calculate the numbers of adults emerging in my woodland each year in the, in the table uh, at the top left. Um, from 2013 onwards by counting the hatched pupae uh, sticking out from the stumps. The maximum number I've recorded in one year was 135 in 2019. <clears throat> so I checked the stumps daily from mid-May to mid-June. And as the adults emerge, the number of pupae uh, is recorded on each stump, which is then numbered with a tag. Then I remove the pupae uh, to avoid double counting. So you can see part of my box of pupae at the bottom there. Um, that as you see, the numbers have fluctuated greatly each year. And the main reasons for these fluctuations are firstly, perhaps stump availability. Um, I cannot really go on felling hundreds of trees every year. So this year I didn't fell quite as many as last year. But secondly, and perhaps more important, as you can see in the bottom right, is predation by greater spotted woodpeckers, which somehow can detect the larvae inside the stump uh, and attack them in winter. I'm thinking in future, I might try putting some mesh cages uh, over some of the occupied stumps in order to keep the woodpeckers away. There is a great mystery attached to the, the clearing. What do they do in nature without stumps? And the clue is perhaps that they, they lay their eggs uh, on damaged trees, but this is something I might try and investigate in the future by actually physically damaging some trees myself. The second species of clearwing I've now found at Spottiswood is the lunar hornet clearwing, Cessia bembesiformis. I've only seen this in Berwickshire in the past two years by use of the new pheromone lure, which is now become available. There are historic records from Berwickshire in 1838 and 1876. And my father, Albert Long, he recorded sallow borings caused by this species at several Berwickshire localities in the 1950s and 60s, 60s, but he never saw an adult. In fact, he never saw clear wing in his whole entomological career, sadly. So this is the lunar hornet clear wing. So this year we've been uh, particularly active, myself and quite a number of other people who have got, got the pheromone bug, and we've been recording around the borders and perhaps maybe one third of the sites I've tried have been been successful. 
using these few Ramon lures. As you can see, the trap uh, in the top center with a, with a, a clear wing approaching it, and one there where the clear wing's trying to get in at the top. Um, so seven of these, we, this year, the species have been recorded at least 16 sites in the Scottish borders by several people, including seven sites in Berwickshire and one just outside the borders at Currifran Wildwood, uh, owned by Borders Forest Trust in Moffatdale. But looking for woodpecker damage, as you can see left and right, uh, at the base of the salad trunks is probably the best way of tracking down this species. At Carifran, damage was noticed uh, last year in 2020, then I returned to the same tree with the lure this year, and within five minutes, uh, we, we caught an adult. So that was quite remarkable, really. So that's that moth. Finally, my last slide uh, is a species of clearwing not yet known in Berwickshire, the current clearwing, Cyanthodon tipuliformis. This may occur in our county, but so far it has been recorded only in nearby Roxburghshire in a garden in, Mal in Melrose by Malcolm Lindsay and others using their pheromone lure. But sadly, it seems to have disappeared from that locality. I did try the lure this year at a local fruit farm, as you see on the right, but so far without success, but it's on my radar for future years. So although I think I've learned a lot about clear wings, I've still got a huge amount to learn and plenty of ideas for the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, you've made some excellent observations and thank you for giving us a talk today. Um, I hadn't quite realised the scale of your woodland restoration project. That was really good to see. I was just wondering if you had any advice for uh, people in the audience who might want to get involved with looking for clear wings in the borders. What can they do to help? Well, I, I, obviously the, 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 the easiest way to see a clearing is to buy one of the Furamorn lures, particularly for the Lunar Hornet clearing, you know, and it does seem to be very widespread in this area. The large red belted, I suspect, is not very widespread. I've looked at other sites where people have cut birch trees, and I, such as Threepwood Moss and in Roxburghshire, and I have not seen any pupil cases. So I do think it's a genuinely a rare species, the large red belted. So, so that's more of a challenge, but the lunar hornet is certainly, um, certainly a, a much easier task. If you own some woodland and have some birch trees, then um, you know, get, your, get your saw out and, and try just cutting a few, in a, particularly in a sunny place. They do like it warm and sunny. And you have to, if you, if you go on holiday at the end of May, you will miss them. So they're very punctual in their emergence. So, um, so you really have to watch out for sunny days in the last week of May and, and early June. So, so that's really the best uh, two bits of advice I can give. But I'm sure there'll be more colonies. Um, it's just hard work finding them. That's great advice. Thank you, David. We've got several uh, comments in the chat box at the side saying super work, uh, great talk, inspirational work, work. So thank you very much for that. And I'll just have a look in the Q&A box as well. Um, we've got a question from Mark Hubert saying, do the pesticides used by the fruit farm industry affect the current clear rings? Um, I, I, I don't know, I have no factual knowledge of that, but I suspect it may do. I mean, it's it, in the south of England, I believe the current clearwing is a serious pest. I think it's called the current borer or, or moth or something like that. So, so I'm, I, I don't think it's a serious pest in Scotland. So I, I don't know, but I suspect using insecticides might, might affect it, yes. There are others who will know the answer to that perhaps better than me. And another question from Carol Robertson saying, how long do the cut stumps remain attractive and would they use cut lying logs? No, I've checked lying logs because often the trees we've cut get stacked up, you know, the trunks get stacked up nearby. I've never seen any evidence that they are used. They really do need living wood. Um, some of the stumps, um, most of Clearly, stumps cut just a few months earlier in the winter, 
uh, are the most attractive. But I have seen uh, two-year-old two stumps, as it were, I have seen them being, being used, but not many. I've gone around my old, old areas uh, every year, and only a few stumps seem to be used in the second year. Great, and we have time for one last question from Ian Rippey saying, have you found that pheromone lures work better in particular weather conditions or at particular times of day? For me, they've only worked in the mornings with the, with the lunar hornet. I've sometimes I've continued it. I, you know, I'd get in my car and drive around various sites, you know, starting first thing in the morning. And a lot of sites, uh, the results are negative. Nothing comes. And I usually wait 10, 15 minutes. And if they don't come in, then I, I hop in the car and go somewhere else. But I've never caught them after 2 p.m. So I think like the large red belt is always seem to emerge in the morn, late morning. So I suspect the lunar hornets are also more active in the mornings. And we did a we did a, a moth night um, with Michelle Stamp at Gordon Community Woodland. And I, I got out the clearing um, pheromone lure at nine o'clock in the morning, hung it up and we had loads of kids around. And suddenly there were five and eight, eight male hornet clearings around the trap. So it was really quite dramatic. And these kids were so excited to see all these, what looked like giant wasps or hornets to them coming in. And when we caught one of these in a box to show the kids, it made a buzzing noise, just like a, a wasp. So this is perhaps part of its mimicry, it can buzz like a wasp. So, um, so that, that was really, really quite, quite remarkable, um, but definitely in the mornings, yes. It's really interesting. Thank you, David. We're gonna have to wrap up there, um, but thank you again for speaking to us. Great talk. I think we've arrived at everybody's favourite part of the day, which is live moth. Uh, yes, so uh, I'm down here on the uh, the Costa del Fife, um, uh, the very warm southern coastline um, where we tend to get good moth activity quite well into the autumn if we get nice weather. Uh, last night's conditions weren't great, but two nights ago uh, it was a mild night with a minimum temperature of 10 and a half degrees and uh, light winds, a little bit of rain, but it was good for the moths. I think I recorded 105 moths of 29 species in the garden. I've obtained, I think, 21 of those species here in boxes next to me. Um, some of them in various states of waking up now they've come out of the fridge. I'll go through some of them, but probably not all. And we'll start off with this one, the Angle Shades, um, quite a distinctive and fairly unmistakable species that many of you might be familiar with. Um, widespread across much of Scotland in, uh, in a variety of habitats and um, frequently found in gardens. Uh, they overwinter in a larval form and uh, in fact it's one of the few species of moths which you can see um, as an adult or even as a larvae uh, pretty much any month of the year um, if you get some, uh, some mild weather. Uh, the larvae feed on a variety of uh, herbaceous plants and trees um, and so you can find them at any time of the year, but primarily the adults um, at the moment, September to October is the peak season for those. Right, next moth I'm going to show you is the green brindled crescent. Get that lined up. Um, sorry, so my USB microscope is back to front, so I have to reverse my brain to get things for you. Right, there we go. So green brindled crescent, another distinctive species. Um, also widespread across much of Scotland. Um, flies in September and October. Um, many habitats, um, including gardens. Um, the larvae feed in the spring um, on a variety of different trees and bushes, uh, including hawthorns and blackthorn. Uh, primarily a sort of fairly brownish looking moth at first glance. Uh, but with these distinctive little um, greenish scales um, dotted about all over. Um, there's also a melanic form, which you can sometimes see in suburban and urban areas, um, but not one I see very often. So it's green brindled crescent. And next up, we have a black rustic. Another familiar autumn moth. 
Many. Nowhere. Struggling to get my name tag in for this one. So this is yeah, this is black rustic. Um I'll stick it down there. There you go. Um, uh, quite a large, long wing species. Um, first glance, um, almost uh, all black in appearance with uh, whitish marks and the kidney uh, mark and standing out against the black background. But if you look in a bit more detail, um, there's actually uh, yeah. markings that you can see um, and variability in the, in the darkness of the coloration. Um, they fly from late August through to October, um, widespread in many open habitats uh, throughout Scotland. Um, the larvae feed from October through till May um, on a variety of plants um, and they overwinter as, as small larvae. That's black rustic. Next up we have a species which won't necessarily be familiar to all of you because its um, distribution is much more localised in Scotland. This is Blair's shoulder knot. Um, there's a very close related species called grey shoulder knot, but that's even rarer in Scotland. Um, I've just been seen a couple of times in um, Dumfries and Galloway, but is expanding its range, so we may see more of it in future years. So Blair's shoulder knot is a recent arrival in the UK. It was only found for the first time in 1951 on the Isle of Wight, and from there over the last 70 years it's spread all the way across England and Wales, um, and it's now found in, um, in parts of uh, southern and southeast Scotland primarily. Um, Fife and Lothian seem to be its stronghold, um, but you can also find it in places in Dumfries and Galloway, the borders through the central belt. Um, it's larvae, the larvae feed on cypress trees uh, in spring and summer. Um, so because of the food plant, it's a species that you're only going to find in uh, urban areas, parks and gardens, um, with, its, uh, with its food plant being non-native. So that's Blair's shoulder knot. And next up will be the autumnal rustic. Um, uh, problems getting my label correct. There we go. Autumnal rustic, um, another very distinctive uh, noctuid moth um, with the uh, largely sort of uh, pale grey brown background, um, distinctive um, black uh, black markings. Um, as you move further north and west in Scotland, you sometimes encounter a pinkish variety of this species, um, which can be really attractive when you, when you get very colourful ones. Uh, these fly from um, middle of August through to early October, so we're at the end of their flight season now. Um, they're pretty widespread across much of Scotland, um, but we're quite fortunate to see you know, lots of or relatively good numbers of them in Scotland. Um, parts of England, they're much more localised and uh, Friends of mine in southern England, it's a species they see only very irregularly. Um, can be found in a variety of open habitats, including gardens, and the larvae feed on uh, a variety of plants and grasses. That's autumnal rustic. Um, I was going to do a pink barred sallow next, but it's currently moving around in the pot, so we'll, we'll maybe come back to that one if we can do. Right, this is one of the copper underwings, um, and although I've not checked the hindwing to be certain, I believe it's a Svensson's copper underwing, which tends to be the more common of this uh, species pair, which is again not widespread throughout all of Scotland. It's uh, localised primarily in names too long to fit that all in. Right, we'll focus on the moth. Uh, so yes, um, primarily in southeast Scotland and um, Central Belt, um, it's a species which is expanding its range, um, as is as is the closely related copper underwing. I won't go into the the difficulties of how you identify the two from looking just at the upper wing markings. Um, these fly from August uh, to September. Um, 
and uh, the larvae feed on a, a variety of trees, um, including oak. So that's uh, a probable Svensson's copper underwing. And next up is a species which I only see occasionally in my garden here because it feeds uh, primarily on well, it feeds on um, common reed. So it primarily is found in, in wetland habitats. Um, but this is a large wainscot. So I usually only get uh, maybe one or two of these a year in the garden. This is the second one this year, so this is probably be my last one. Uh, it's quite a large species, long wings, um, pale sort of sandy brown coloration. Only likely to confuse it with um, uh, bull, bulrush wainscot, which is um, a little bit more patterned. Uh, the veins stand out a little bit more. Um, it's much larger than other kinds of wainscots, like a common and smoky, which fly earlier in the year. Um, large wainscots really on the wing, primarily September and October, they can see a little bit earlier. Um, it's quite scattered and localised in its distribution across Scotland, so it's not a species that uh, everyone will record. It seems to have got some kind of little critter running around over it there, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, so the larvae feed um, primarily or, or exclusively on the common reed on the stems and roots. Um, so you'll find this primarily in habitats where common reed is, uh, is abundant. Um, although the adults are uh, well documented to, uh, um, to range quite widely. And the last two I was going to show you. If I can get them to settle nicely. Right, this is a, a pale mottled willow. Um, this is probably the most surprising moth I caught on uh, Thursday. It's um, not a species I encounter very frequently in Scotland. Um, although nationally across the whole of the UK, its population hasn't particularly declined. In Northern England and Scotland, it's declined quite significantly in, uh, in recent years and is now quite a scarce site. Um, I believe most of, the, uh, most of the records I have of it in Fife in my garden um, relate to migrants um, rather than a, a resident population, but it's obviously difficult to prove that. Um, the larvae feed on the grains of cereal crops, um, and there may be something to do with, uh, with that that's, that's triggered the decline in Scotland. Um, you can get records from June right through to October, but primarily um, July and August is the peak. So that's pale mottled willow. And so I'm going to do one last one. Do you want to try to go to Tom then? Uh, Tom uh, doesn't be happy enough to, um, for you to go ahead, Nigel, because he's not confident that his camera will work. So if you wanted to proceed, then that's fine. OK, right. Um, so this is pink barred sallow, another pretty autumnal moth. Um, you can separated from some of the other rather similar looking sallow species by the, the dark pinkish brown head. Um, flying typically from late August or through till middle of October. Uh, it's another species pretty widespread across most of Scotland. Um, the larvae feed in, in, feed in spring, first of all, on sallow and poplar catkins, um, and then they move on to a variety of herbaceous plants. Um, you can find it in a, a variety of habitats, open, lightly wooded, um, including gardens as well. So it's pink barred sallow. Um, I focus largely on noctuaries just because they're um, more reliable for sitting still. Um, we'll have a go at doing uh, some of the slightly more lively species, starting with a red green carpet. So this is a red green carpet, a geometer, much more delicate looking than uh, the robust noctures we've been looking at up till now. Um, primarily a, a greenish coloured moth with um, variable flecks of, uh, of red through it, hence its name. Um, emerges in the autumn, uh, in September to October, and then they overwinter as an adult. Um, reappearing in much smaller numbers in the spring. Um, it's widespread and common throughout Scotland, uh, primarily in wooded habitats, uh, and feeds on a variety of deciduous trees, including uh, oaks and rowan. 
So that's red green carpet. And let's have a go and see if this snout will behave itself. Right, so this is a snout, um, gets its name from its um, elongated palps. The palps are those things that are sticking out from its, uh, from its face effectively. I don't think I'm going to be able to get my little label in this picture because it's in a large pot. Um, so this is called snout, hypena. Provos, Provos, Provos scarlis. Um, there's a couple of generations of this as an adult, uh, one in summer, one in um, one in autumn, September, October time. Um, can be quite numerous at this time of year in my garden trap. I often get 20 to 30 of them. Um, pretty widespread across much of Scotland, um, and you find it in a, a, a range of different habitats, uh, including gardens, obviously. So that's the snout. Um, right. My common marbled carpet is sitting quite nicely at the moment, so let's have a look at him. So this is a common marbled carpet, one of uh, a species pair with dark marbled carpet, which are quite similar in appearance. Um, the, this form of common marble carpet with the orange uh, median fascia, that's the sort of the central band. Um, this colour form is only found in common marble carpets, so you don't have to worry about identification difficulties when you catch this particular form. Um, it's another common widespread species throughout much of Scotland. Um, that you'll find in a variety of habitats um, and again in your garden, quite a common one to see. That's common marble carpet. And let's see who else I can show you. Let's do... All right, we've got spruce carpet now, who is sitting quietly. So spruce carpet and grey pine carpet are uh, two species which are quite similar in appearance. Um, the spruce carpet, the, um, the medium fascia, that's the central band across, is usually outlined um, with a white border, um, which you can see quite clearly on this one, which helps separate it from the grey pine carpet, but you do get intermediate ones, which can be really difficult to identify. Um, as the name suggests, it feeds on um, a variety of coniferous trees, um, so you tend to get it in, uh, in mixed woodlands, coniferous woodlands uh, and um, suburban settings. Um, so that's spruce carpet. I think I'm getting to the end of my slot now, so I'm going to just see if I can show you a micro for a bit of variability. Um, this one seems to be sitting quite nicely at the moment. Although I'm not sure how well that's going to show up as anything other than just a small brown moth, but this is a Claris rhombana, species which I see only two or three of in the year in the garden, um, and they were quite late in appearance this year. So just try to get that the right way up. So it flies in August and September primarily, so this is quite a late one. I'm just a little bit surprised to see one of these on Thursday. Um, one of uh, a number of different Eclera species which uh, occur throughout across Scotland um, and can be quite difficult to, to identify. Um, but this has a, a fairly distinctive shape and a sort of crisscross network pattern, which unfortunately isn't showing up particularly well underneath my, um, my USB microscope. But that's Eclera rhombana. And I'll do one last noctuid because it's sitting here nicely. And that will finish up. So this is a lunar underwing, um, which can be one of the more abundant um, species in, in traps at this time of year. Um, particularly common in open grassy environments, um, but uh, they do well in, in gardens too. Um, and they fly from late August, September through, through until sort of mid-October time. That's Lena underwing. 
Um, and I will, I'll leave it at that and uh, pass you back to Epiphany. Thank you, Nigel. It was brilliant. Very professional as always. And you've upped your game now with those labels. So amazing stuff. Thank you. Our next talk is from Di Rees, who has the slightly daunting job title of Head of Conservation for Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. So no easy task, I'm sure. He's here to say hello and to tell us about BC's vision for the future. Di, welcome to Virtual Scotland. Thank you very much, Bethany, and good morning to everybody. Um, I just want to check if you can hear and see me okay. Yes, we can. We can. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So good morning, everybody. Um, so as Epiphany said, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I'm Di Reese, um, and yeah, it is quite a daunting uh, job title for Head of Conservation for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. Um, I thought I'd just spend a couple of minutes giving you a bit of background to myself because I'm still fairly new to BC. And then um, the next 10 minutes or so after that, speaking as Epiphany said, about our new strategy, although there's only so much I can say because we're slightly out with our timings um, because there will be a public launch on Wednesday next week on the 7th. So I will speak a bit about that. And also um, just the other major piece of work that we've been working on in Scotland, which is Species on the Edge. So myself, so I'm Di Rees. Um, I've been with, B I started with BC in on the 6th of September. 2019 as the head of conservation for Wales um, and then following the review and the impact of COVID that that role was uh, extended to cover Scotland and Northern Ireland. Previous to that I was 20 years as a civil servant but not quite as you'd expect so from 2000 to 2013 I was with Forestry Commission Wales um, as a conservation ranger um, and conservation manager and in that time uh, I worked quite a lot with BC and Wales, particularly with Russell and uh, Judy. And then after that, we became Natural Resources Wales. Um, and I worked as an area manager in the Wine Valley. So we did some work there. Um, and part of that involved scarce hooktip um, and a couple of other really quite rare species. And from that, I became the team leader. So I was responsible for a team that looked after about 32,000 hectares of forestry land uh, in South and Mid Wales. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so I'll start with uh, species on the edge. I will try and share my screen. I've thrown a bit of a curveball to Anthony, um, unfortunately, because uh, I haven't had this ready. But let's see if we can see if that's going to work. Okay, it looks to me like it's working. So Species on the Edge. So Species on the Edge um, is a Scotland project and it's made up of a partnership of seven nature conservation charities and Nature Scott, so eight organisations in total. Um, if I can show you this infographic, there's quite a lot there. Um, but it sets out, so on the left-hand side there, you can see the organisations that are involved. Um, it's a project specifically aimed at the safeguarding of Scotland's coasts and island wildlife rather than across the whole country. Um, and it was uh, in the inception and the original application were back in 2019. So the circle that's sort of the top, you can see the seven areas, this landscape scale areas that we're, we're talking about, that we've concentrated on. Um, and it's very much about dedicated to improving the fortunes of 40 priority species uh, within those areas. And it is very much a species project, but obviously engagement is, is a crucial part of how we can deliver that. So the vision is to work with local communities uh, in some of Scotland's most remote areas and establishing projects that provide a vital lifeline for our most nationally and internationally vulnerable coastal wildlife. Um, we've just come to the end of the development period. And for ourselves, so we, uh, we had a project officer of part of that, and that was David Hill from our uh, Scotland team, who did a fantastic job in very difficult circumstances, as did, as did the other development officers, um, having to deal with COVID and not being able to get out on site when we'd like to, um, but pulling it together um, and putting together um, information um, and bringing it all together in a way that we can use for us to refine as a steering group 
Um, and at the moment, our final application for submission to the lottery is November this year. If we're successful uh, in getting the application in on time and then subsequently successful with our funding, um, we will be starting towards the end of or middle end of next year. And that as a project as a whole is worth somewhere in the region of about five million pounds people take across those areas. Um, so as you can see, it's probably one of the biggest projects uh, that's happened in Scotland for a long time of that scale um, and that level. For us as BC, we've got a number of species that we're specifically uh, targeting. And in, so that will be small blue um, and northern brown argus. Um, our marsh artillery, new forest bonnet moth, slender scotch bonnet moth, transparent moth, and talisca bonnet moth. And they're spread. So the main areas that we're concentrating on are the east coast, north coast, Solway, and our garland in the Hebs. Um, so yeah, at the moment, um, we're just pulling it together uh, and we're looking to get it submitted uh, in November and hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be on the way to doing a fantastic project. And there's a lot of engagement as well. As you can see, we're looking at sort of engaging with 20,000 people from sort of all walks of life, all backgrounds, um, all abilities. Uh, and I think that this species is a very good way, a very good way of doing that and engaging with people that it's there's no real boundaries as such associated with species and particularly butterflies and moths so we're really looking forward to um take looking to taking that forward and being successful with that uh the strategy as i sort of alluded to a little bit earlier the there's a public launch for our strategy which would be on the 7th of october which is next wednesday so um What's not a sort of full embargo, there's, there's only so much, unfortunately, I can say. I wanted to say a little bit more today, but we're going to have to wait. But I'll go through what I can, um, but I'm happy to answer questions in the chat later. Or once the um, once the strategy is public from the middle of next week, you know, we're more than happy to answer questions, um, phone calls and emails um, if, you, if you have any queries about it. So our strategy. So it's very much about building on the work that we do and that we have done for over the last 50 years. Um, as somebody that still feels fairly new to BC, um, I think that what we achieve uh, with your help and members and volunteers' help and supporters' help is, is phenomenal for the size of the organisation that we are. Um, we quite often hear the phrase that we punch above our weight, and I actually um, think that's absolutely true. You know, for an organisation of our size, our impact is massive across a wide range of sort of networks and stakeholders and partners. So um, it's very much about building on the work that we do. It's also obviously about responding to the urgency of the nature and the climate crisis. Um, clearly important, and as Epiphany alluded to earlier, we have COP26 in Glasgow later on this year. Um, and now is a really good time to be involved in this, thinking about this, um, and actually releasing our strategy. Uh, the timing for that, I think, is really good. Um, lots of organisations uh, and governments have signed up to the climate emergency um, on the nature emergency or nature crisis. Uh, so I th actually think that having this strategy, which very clearly sets out our goals and ambitions, um, puts us in a really good uh, position going forward um, to work with uh, funders and stakeholders and partners and members and volunteers. It will increase our work in a way that's relevant to where people live and to work. Um, it's very much about engagement. Um, I think it would be fair to say that as an organisation we're aware that our engagement isn't maybe what it could be for various reasons and that's fine. Um, it's about taking it forward and moving on um, and identifying those gaps uh, and look at ways and setting goals and ambitions as to how we can improve that, or how we can take that forward. So our overall aim, incredibly ambitious, but actually um, one that's very sort of worthwhile is to see a world where moths and butterflies are thriving. And we can't do that ourselves. Um, it's very much about working together, working with members, with volunteers, 
with supporters, with funders, with stakeholders, with organisations in Scotland, the wider UK, and even further afield internationally. Um, and I think that that is absolutely the way forward. The Species on the Edge project sort of shows that, that you can achieve far more um, in working in that partnership rather than in isolation. And I think you'll have noticed, as I have, that over the last probably 10, 12 years, that many organisations that traditionally or back in the past may have sort of sort of ploughed their own furrow um, very much now working together because they see that, that sort of strengthening numbers and the, the value that you can get when you're working as part of a bigger organisation and, and stakeholder uh, engagement group. So that's sort of pretty much about what I can say about giving too much more away. Um, as I say, the public launch is the 7th of October, so that's next Wednesday. Um, and after that, uh, there is still sort of a period of consultation. Um, there is still an element of refinement to do for us internally at BC, but also wider. You know, if you have people have thoughts and ideas, then please do let us know. Um, but I, we're looking at sort of implementing it sort of from next year and taking it forward um, once we once we sort of clearer on our sort of where we're going and how we um, are going to deliver this. So. I think sort of time-wise, we're about there. And I'd like to finish, um, I'll stop sharing my screen actually. Uh, there we go. Um, with some thank yous, actually. So as I've said, I still feel fairly new to BC, um, but I've got a wish to say sort of a huge thank you um, to the team in Scotland. Um, without them, I'd, I was going to say I'd struggle. I actually probably wouldn't be able to do my job um, without them. So their their incredible sort of knowledge and experience, support and help is 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 extremely valued uh, by myself. Um, and to yourselves as members and volunteers and supporters, without your commitment, um, without your work, without your efforts, um, we wouldn't be where we are. Um, and, and going forward, I think that and your that support of yours um, puts us in an incredibly strong position um, and as has been mentioned before but I'd like to reiterate what the epiphany was saying to our funders such as Nature's Got the Lottery their commitment and their funding and their um, ability to see what we want to do um, and that sort of confidence in who we are and that we do deliver I think we are rightly known as an organisation that can deliver on many fronts in many ways um, and that is much appreciated and thank you all for your time this morning. I've really enjoyed it so far. I hope you have too, and there's lots more to come. Um, thank you. Thanks, Dave. It was really nice to see you. I know COVID has kind of hampered plans for you coming up to Scotland, but we're really looking forward to getting to know you and working with you more, and uh, especially when it comes to the new strategy. Thank you again. So next up, we have a talk from an extremely dedicated volunteer, Chris Stamp, who has a passion for the purple hair streak. Now I've seen this talk before, so I can tell you it's brilliant. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to seeing it again with some updates. So Chris, over to you. Thanks very much, Bethany. So I'll just share my screen just now. That looks great. Great. Okay. Yep. So as Epiphany mentioned, I've been looking at uh, purple hair streaks uh, over the last couple of years, really, because prior to 2020, I, I really didn't know anything at all about um, purple hair streaks, despite being an active recorder in Scotland for more than 20 years. I, I kind of thought, like a lot of people, that purple hair streaks were a rare species and there was not much chance of seeing them. I didn't, didn't really pay a lot of attention to them. Um, but during 2020, um, I discovered that's not the case at all. And we even found them in our garden, which was a, a real eye opener. So I've been trying to spread the words about purple hair streak um, ever since, um, doing a few presentations and uh, hoping that other people can get interested in them as well. Uh, so really this presentation is about uh, what happened after I spread the word, did a few presentations and and uh, and got some other people interested. So it's really more about what other people are doing than, than what I've been doing. Um, other than um, following up from my previous presentation at the East Scotland branch, which I left on a little bit of a cliffhanger, so I'll, I'll also follow up on that as well. Um, so just to start with, this is a picture from um, Octomonty Common in Fife by Simon Watson. So this is a, a nice one. You don't see many pictures of purple hair streaks, which is why people don't know a lot about them, because they spend most of their time up at the top of the trees. Uh, so it's nice to, to get a picture 
low down like this one. So thanks very much for this, Simon. So why purple hair streaks? Why am I so interested in them? Um, it's really because they're Scotland's secret butterfly. Um, they, they've got the perfect lifestyle for avoiding butterfly recorders and not many people come across them um, accidentally. It's really only if you know what you're looking for, know how to find them and make a particular effort. Um, they fly at the top, top of oak trees and they, they fly in the evenings. So, so most people out during the day looking for butterflies just, just won't come across them at all. As a result, they're, they're very under-recorded. Um, so when I started looking for them in 2020, I, I came up with some surprising results. So I followed up sharing, sharing information, uh, do it, doing my own kind of PR effort to try and get people interested and familiar with them. Um, and there's been many new discoveries as a result of that and also work that other people have been doing independently of my efforts. Um, gradually, we're learning more and more about purple hair streak in Scotland. Uh, and thankfully, we have a few new purple hair streak addicts. Um, so, so there's a good few of us now looking for them and adding information. Um, having said that, there's there's definitely more discoveries to be made, and there's a few uh, intriguing mysteries that we need to do a little bit more work to solve. Uh, so that's a follow on from um, my last presentation, which, as I mentioned, was on a little bit of a cliffhanger. I'd been picking up eggs um, on windfall oak twigs uh, just by chance. I found one, and that kind of inspired me to keep looking for them. I ended up with a little bit of a collection of, of purple hair streak eggs, which uh, I picked them up because then they were rescued because not being on the trees anymore, they were they were not going to survive. So I was able to just to collect them uh, and attempt to rear the caterpillars. Um, and at, when I did my talk for the, for the East Scotland branch AGM, uh, I'd got to the point where I had some purple hysteric pupa, but I couldn't show anything more than that at that point. Um, so just to recap quickly for people who didn't see that presentation, this is a picture of the egg, a picture of um, a purple hysteric caterpillar actually emerging from its egg. Um, on, the, on the right here, a video uh, which I managed to capture. This is uh, very much sped up. Um, this is 20 minutes of a purple hair streak, freshly emerged caterpillar making its way from an egg on an old twig across to a fresh oak bud, which I provided for it. Uh, so it looked like I managed to, to see this at 2.30 a.m. Uh, and managed to capture a video of it and, and turn it into kind of stop motion, um, faster video. So these are some more pictures of the, of the purple hair streak life cycle. This was um, the one on the left here is a tiny one and a half millimeter caterpillar, which actually emerged in, in my fridge, which is a long story, but luckily I managed to intercept it and transfer it onto an oak bud um, on, the, on the right here, second instar caterpillar. And the fascinating thing about these caterpillars is they actually completely change camouflage uh, from one instar to another. So they track the, the changes in the, in the oak buds and the development of the oak tree and transform themselves at each change so that they're perfectly camouflaged, um, but in, in very different ways between each instar. And then here's a pupa. So this is the point that we'd got to um, in my last presentation. So, so what happened next? I did successfully get some purple hair streak butterflies, thankfully. Uh, so this one on the left, you can see it kind of taking a drink, um, get some salts from, from my wife's finger just after it emerged. Um, you'll notice here that there's a green background there. So what I'd done is I, I had the pupa in, um, in a, a rearing cage and it kind of set it up as a photographic studio with some nice props and a green screen in the background. The idea being that I would be able to do some digital processing and replace the, the green screen with some uh, kind of more natural looking backgrounds. Didn't entirely go to plan. Some of the butterflies just escaped before, before I could photograph them. Uh, so a few times I, I opened the cage trying to get pictures and the butterfly was off and purple hair streaks being a, a treetop species, they just disappeared to the tops of the trees. Uh, so I didn't even get a chance to see whether they were male or female, so I didn't get a photograph of them. Um, but this one was a particularly helpful one, this female. She did hang around for quite a while, so I managed to get some good pictures of her. And this is a, a close-up picture, and hopefully, depending on your internet connection, you'll be getting a, a video there of, of her sitting um, in the breeze, looking very nice. Obviously, a very, very fresh butterfly looking at her best. Uh, so this is one of the male butterflies. I did, I did manage to get a, a good shot of a male. You can see here I've adjusted the, the green screen background, just neutralize it down to grey. My plan is uh, to 
change some backgrounds like this. This is this is my first attempt. Um, but yes, over the winter, I need to I need to learn to improve my Photoshop skills and hopefully we'll come up with some some better uh, attempts than this one. And this is a picture of the female butterfly gradually making her way up the, the stick that I provided for her. Um, I hadn't, at this point, I, I hadn't seen a, a female. The ones I'd, I'd released were males. Um, so this one, I was really hoping that it was a female. Um, but she took 20 minutes kind of from emergence climbing up this stick. So I was waiting patiently, hoping it would be a female. I managed to get some of these uh, good pictures of the undersides in the meantime. So um, we did a 2021 survey um, it was something I was trying to push and trying to get as many people to help us as possible. I was able to find a lot of new sites myself during 2020, but I was keen to, to get other people involved if I could. Uh, so I actually did a few presentations. I did, did one at Tayside Biodiversity. Um, I wrote some articles for various newsletters, a uh, brisk newsletter, posted a lot on social media. So people might have been following my kind of posts on the East Scottish Butterflies Facebook group. Um, also on, on the, the, the BC Scotland, uh, Twitter and Facebook. As, as I was uh, discovering more and more, I was providing images of that. So gradually hope, hopefully getting more and more people interested in, in the species. So this is where we stood in terms of the survey. This is where we stood at the start of the year. So May, May 2021, before the butterflies emerge. These are maps which I created myself manually. So it's a mixture of data from various sources. Uh, some of it from butterfly conservation, the purple dots here from butterfly conservation data um, up to 2007. Um, but to, to keep the maps up to date, I was adding, adding my own information. So uh, the orange dots here, things, records that I'd seen or heard of, which I could add to bring them up to date to 2020. Um, so gradually we're kind of in increasing our knowledge of the distribution, but 2021 was, was a big push. And the red dots here show what we managed to achieve in, achieve in 2021. Uh, so you can see a, a big uh, a big increase, and not just in one area, but across many parts of the distribution. And this was due to the efforts of, uh, of various people. But I'd like to talk about that next. So in the end, we got um, 26 new 10 kilometer squares, which uh, which yeah, I, I thought maybe we'd get 10 or 15. Um, but yeah, I hadn't banked on the fact that a couple of other people would would pick up this uh, this project and, and make some amazing contributions. Um, so yeah, if you actually count these dots, you will see that there aren't 26 red dots there. There's a couple of red dots which are off the map, which are, I'll come to later. So yeah, I'd like to talk about the stories behind the map because um, updates to the map uh, is one thing, but obviously there's a lot of kind of human stories and human endeavor behind that uh, and some, some really significant kind of discoveries in historical terms. In particular, we had two new county records um, from modern times, so that's West Lothian, where I don't think the species had ever been recorded before, and the Scottish borders where there were some very historical records, but no currently known records. We discovered a large colony at um, Lochleave and NNR, uh, discoveries at Karen Glen Asiluti Reserve, some new discoveries on the West Coast Islands, which I'll describe in a little bit more detail later. Um, lots of increased awareness. We even ended up with some mainstream press coverage, not, not part of the strategy, but um, we were generating enough interest that, uh, that newspapers were picking up what we were doing and some very dedicated news spotters. So just to cover some of the stories um, working north to south, um, in the northern part of the range, um, we managed to make a huge difference to the maps and really just down to the efforts of one novice butterfly recorder who'd seen my presentation at the Tayside Biodiversity Conference. Um, so that was Carol Pudsey, who's a geologist, and she'd not previously recorded butterflies at all, um, other than taking part in the big butterfly count. Um, she saw her first ever purple hystrix on the 24th of July, um, and I met her after that just to, just to help confirm her ID skills, and she, she was actually recording the hystrix, which she was. Um, and by the end of August, Carol had recorded 40 new sites, including six new 10K squares, which was a fantastic result. Uh, so just to put that into perspective, this, this is a, a map taken from iRecord showing the 2021 Purple History records in, in Perthshire and Angus. Um, so a, a lot of records here, and these were Carol's records. So you can see how much difference one person who... Uh, focused on this species could made in, make in terms of increasing our knowledge. So um, a brilliant result from Carol. 
Another thing that Carol added was uh, she gave me the, the ability to test out a theory that I'd had. So, so purple esterix is oak trees, and most of the remaining mature oak trees uh, tend to be around stately homes where the, the, the oak trees are protected from being felled historically. Um, these places tend to close their doors in the evening, so uh, it's quite likely that you, you get good populations of purple hair streaks at these areas that nobody ever come, comes across because pe people are just not in the right place at the right time. Um, but, but Carol arranged for us to get access to Glam's Castle um, after hours to do a survey. Uh, so we, we had the opportunity to test that theory then. So we started at 4 p.m. We split up and headed off towards different areas of the estate that, that had oaks. Um, I managed to test another theory, which is that they don't fly until the evening. And sure enough, you know, we were serving from four o'clock and we simultaneously started to see the purple hair streaks just after five o'clock. So, so we sent text messages to each other at more or less the same time saying that we'd, we'd seen our first purple hair streak of the evening. Uh, so this is the areas within Glam's estate that we came across purple hair streaks and a range of different habitats, tree lines, individual trees and uh, and uh, alongside the river there. So it's, it's a very good site, but unless you have permission to be there after 5 p.m., nobody's going to see them. Um, so Carol suggested uh, that we actually monitor this site in future because it's a very stable habitat. It's not likely to change year to year, uh, which sounds like a good idea. So we, we'll aim to do that and, and monitor how the population progresses. So moving south a bit to Dundee, so, so Keith Edwards is, is the pioneer in Dundee. He's been seeing purple hair streaks in the east of Scotland since well well before I have. And in fact, he was pretty much the only person uh, who'd come across purple hair streaks um, across towards the east coast. So his, his sighting in 2009 was well outside the known range. Um, so, so yeah, that really started to hint that there was something interesting going on there in terms of the current knowledge of this species. Um, he, he did look at drumming up some interest in 2013 on a, on a forum. Uh, he, he only had limited interest, but luckily I came across his post six years later, about the same time that I was seeing some of the work that Ian Cow was doing down in the borders with white letter hair streak. And um, we don't have white letter hair streak where I live in Perthshire, but um, I was intrigued to see if maybe could do something similar with purple hair streaks. So combined with, with Keith's uh, posts and his hints that they may be out there, uh, that was really what got me started. In 2021, I, I managed to find purple hair streaks at a couple of new sites near Dundee at Camperdown Park and Backmere Wood, which is a woodland trust woodland. These are interesting because um, they're quite close together, but they're quite different habitats. Camperdown Park is a big uh, parkland with uh, hundreds of mature trees. Backmere Wood is, is, a, is a kind of a, a more recent woodland with continuous canopy um less mature trees but it turns out they're much easier to find at back in your wood so it's not just that the kind of the size and the maturity of the oak trees that that dictates the habitat um it, there's obviously a lot more subtlety to it than just the oak trees uh, just moving south again down to five so five had a few purple hair street records um this is the map from 1997 to 2020 the blue dots here show the records almost all in southwest Fife, but a couple of hints there from Duncan Davidson's records that there may be in other areas. So we organised um, a survey with uh, Gillian Fife and Elspeth Christie, the recorders from Fife, to try and see if we could fill in some of those blanks and make some similar discoveries that, from what we managed to do in Perth here and other areas. And this was our 2021 results. So a big difference there, um, lots of red dots, the, the big circles show the new 10k squares. Um, so Keith Edwards, again, he discovered them in St Andrews. Uh, Diane Wilson found them at East Weems. Um, so yeah, some, some really good results with a big difference to the distribution for player streaks in five. Um, my contribution was the site at um, Loch Leven. I, I was on my way back from a, an attempt to find them in Edinburgh, which we'll talk about later. Um, it passed Loch Leven about 8 p.m., just had 10 minutes of sunshine left and stopped off there and managed to find them there, which I um, publicised on Facebook. Um, and since then, Loch Leven's become the popular site for Purple Hair Street Spotters. Simon Ritchie, the reserve manager, uh, wrote something on his blog. And judging by iRecord and the comments on his blog, there was a stream of visitors after that. Uh, so really, that's the place for people to go and learn to see Purple Hair Streaks if they're not already familiar with them. We, we did a field trip also. Uh, so this is a picture of, of the, the people from Fife on the field trip to, to get more people familiar with the species. And what was interesting about this field trip for me is that we, 
we kind of drove to the field trip in pouring rain and it was it looked like it was going to be terrible conditions we, we had no chance whatsoever of seeing purple hesterics but we did you know there was there was no sunshine very gloomy conditions reasonably warm and we did actually manage to spot purple hair streaks uh, flying around in conditions where I, I wouldn't have even bothered going out on a survey. So uh, that was something that I learned that day. Uh, this is a picture from Simon showing a bit more of the habitat. And uh, this is this was picked up by the Daily Record. They, they saw Simon's blog. Uh, so we ended up with a purple hair streak article in the Daily Record covering that. So if people want to visit this site, it's a very easy site to visit. Good numbers of butterflies and good car parking. Um, it's just along the road from the RSBB site at Lockley, about a mile to the east. You can park, walk down to the river, walk across the bridge, across the river, and you can see the purple area here is, is the habitat. But do remember, evenings only. If you go there on a, a sunny day, and during the day, you're not going to see them. You need to be there in the evening when the adults, um, when the males are holding territories and flying around. Uh, this is a fascinating sighting at Kinross, not too far away. Um, a purple hair streak spotted by Hazel Hislop uh, at the pedestrian crossing in Kinross High Street, uh, which is not normal habitat, so very interesting sighting. Uh, luckily, she managed to pick it up and, and put it to safety where it wouldn't get stood on. Moving south again down to Falkirk and Belothian. So this story is really about what um, Gail and Jeff Ballinger managed to do. So they're new purple hair streak addicts who spent a lot of time searching for sites. So they're purple the first ever purple hair streaks um, at the Loch Leven site shortly after I was posting about it and went on to carry out more than 20 different surveys over the following month with some really spectacular results. Four new tanky squares um, in two new counties uh, for modern times. Now this is an interesting technique that Jeff um, introduced which is uh, taking pictures of the, of the canopy without even really knowing if there's any butterflies there. If, if you see a little bit of a hint of movement, then you suspect they might be up there. So just take some photographs anyway, and then look at the photographs when you get home. So, so Jeff managed to actually identify some, some purple hair streaks that way without actually knowing that he was taking a picture of a purple hair streak, which was a very interesting new technique. And these are some of Jeff's uh, pictures. So it's some really nice ones showing what you're likely to see in the field. Uh, to be honest, this is more of a view you'd get through binoculars. So Jeff's, uh, managed to, to capture some from quite a long distance there. This is a picture I wanted to show because it, it shows the male without the blue sheen on it. Most of the photographs you'll see of a male purple hair streak is trying to show off the blue sheen, but in practice, when you're in the field looking for them, you might be just seeing a chocolate brown butterfly. It's only in certain light that you capture the, the blue sheen. And this, this explains how Jeff manage, manages to, to get these pictures of butterflies up in the trees with his, uh, with his camera there, 400 millimeter lens manages to, to bring them in uh, a lot closer. And what was interesting about what Jeff and Gail did was that they not only found a few new sites, they also found an edge to the range because they were, they were looking in places where we were getting negative results. So the negative results in some ways were just as interesting as the, as the positive results. Uh, so this tracks their surveys. So they started out in Edinburgh um, not managing to find them, followed up um, Nigel Voden's record from Calendar House in Falkirk and managed to get a sighting there and then gradually moved down the M9 uh, to, fight, to pick up some more sites. And at this point, they're heading into areas where there was no previous records. And again, checking in Edinburgh, turning up blanks, uh, Livingston blanks, um, but coming up with, with a few new, uh, interesting new sites. And then a positive sighting in, in Livingston. Uh, so combined with some, some surveys other people were doing, it looks like there's no purple hair streaks in Edinburgh. So they, this shows the results of other people's efforts. Um, Colin and Dorothy Whitehead and Duncan Davidson um, and myself and, and my wife, Alana, we, we looked around Edinburgh but couldn't find them. So there does seem to be an edge to the distribution there. Um, there are purple hair streaks in Fife just across the, the, the fourth. Um, but for some reason not in Edinburgh. So why should that be? That, that's a real mystery. Climate, not not climate, because it's Edinburgh and the, and the area is surrounded by purple hair streak uh, distribution. Haven't been able to say anything about geology or soil that would really explain it. There's nothing that unique about it. There's plenty of oaks, um, ants, possibly that purple hair streaks have a relationship with ants. Um, but I couldn't really comment too much about that. I don't know much about it, but it, it's one of the factors. 
possibly geography, our purple hair streaks expanding from the West and just haven't arrived there yet, maybe. Um, historical issues, pollution, um, lack of aphids due to pollution, lack of honeydew, which is what purple hair streaks feed on. Um, it's a possibility, but we really don't know. Uh, possibly that there's, there's not enough kind of woodland sites providing population reservoirs. Um, there's interesting metapopulation dynamics, which you can read about in Martin's book, uh, which potentially explains how butterflies kind of retreat to caught areas at certain years and then spread out again. Okay, so the Scottish borders, yeah, as of 2020, there was no currently known purple hair streaks to the Scottish borders, just some very historical records. I, I wrote a newsletter for uh, an article in Ian Cow's uh, borders newsletter speculating that they could be present, just, just undiscovered. Um, they hadn't been seen for, for over 100 years. And in, and in August, Gil and Jeff did discover purple hair streaks in the borders at um, hair stains. So that's after a 140 year gap. Um, and it was also the first overlap with white letter hair streaks, which are, are making their way into the border. So it's the first area in Scotland that we know of where you can see both of them. Have they been there all this time? Have they been there for over 100 years without being recorded? I think the answer is that probably they just they have the perfect lifestyle for avoiding butterfly recorders. Uh, and in, we've seen them in, in many new areas where they just haven't been seen for a long time, but probably have been there for, um, all along. So now we need to join the dots. We have this isolated record in the borders so how does it connect does it connect to populations in england or the west are there are there more sites throughout the borders uh, so it's going to be an interesting project for 2021 and south west branch this is a little bit outside my area I, I do most of my work in the in the east um but i managed to, to kind of summarize a little bit what's happened in the southwest so as far as we can tell purple air street range covers the entire southwest branch area and, and they're equally under recorded there so so tam stewart's done some great work and he, he also had a, a sighting in the daily record last year he, tam also recorded a couple of new 10k squares this year along the clyde in lanarkshire um, they're certainly present in glasgow compared to the absence in edinburgh or the apparent absence in edinburgh until, until somebody proves otherwise the strong populations in stirlingshire and this is the, the, the islands. They, they were previously known from Collinsay, although not recently recorded, but they're definitely previously seen there. But in 2021, we had confirmed discovery on Mull for the first time, and also very recently uh, discovered on Isla, which is a fascinating site, quite, quite well to the west of Isla. Uh, so you can see from that red dot there on Isla, if they're there, then you would expect they must be in that gap as well. In Jura, you would expect that they should be present there. So some interesting potential for surveys over there. Highlands branch, the, just the distribution at the moment just about extends into the Highland branch. They're known from Fort William area and the Morven Peninsula. Um, they're not currently known elsewhere in the Highlands branch, but there's bound to be new discoveries to be made. And certainly there's some intriguing historical hints. Uh, this is a map um, from George Thompson's book in 1980, uh, where he reports on some, some old records from the Russia coast up there on the Northwest and also in Murray. And his, his feeling at that time was uh, that there's no reason to dispute those records. So there's potentially big areas where purple history uh, might still occur and it just needs somebody to find them. Uh, so we learned quite a lot this year, very under-recorded species, more gaps to fill on the maps. Um, it's, a, it's a wider countryside butterfly in the middle third of Scotland and Dumfries and Galloway. Um, some high density sites, not rare and actually one of the most common sites. So at certain times of year, this is actually a common butterfly, not the rare butterfly, which certainly I thought it was a couple of years ago. Uh, they can, however, be very elusive. They can be present in very low numbers. The high density sites seem to be more the oak woodlands with uh, varied structure and protective ground flora rather than the exposed trees in kind of parklands and farmland. Uh, they don't need very mature oaks in those um, woodlands. 2021 and 2020, uh, Keith Edwards believes they've been very good purple history years. He's been watching them for a while and they've been very high numbers recently. The, 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 the flight times in 2021 was July 15th to 8th of September, uh, fly in the evenings, and people can find eggs. Uh, I don't think people had been finding eggs until the last couple of years, but I know there's at least five people now who've had success finding the eggs. Um, in, in the areas where the densities are low, 
the males use the very highest trees. So this is a this is a site at Kettings near Cooper Angus, where I was confident I'd be able to find plenty of purple hestrix because there's so many mature oaks. In practice, I could only find them on the very highest oaks, uh, where the, the males had gathered together in twos and threes. Um, so if you're looking at an area where there don't seem to be many, you need to really be looking at the very high trees. And the good sites though, um, Uktamukti Common, Dundee Riverside, people can see them actually very low down in, in, in trees that you wouldn't think were suitable. So if the habitat is right, they will come down um, and you know, change their habits quite a bit. Um, so real social media really allowed this kind of effort to spread. You know, we, we had a lot of people joining in because they were able to see what was happening up to date. You know, you could you can share a sighting or share some news and then the next evening people can go out and, and follow it up very quickly. They don't have to wait for a newsletter or anything like that. So it's been great to kind of build up a, a community of uh, purple hair streak spotters and found that I record actually, uh, if you're entering your records as you see them, it works quite well as a communication device. So some days I would, I would be out trying to find purple hair streaks. Maybe some days I didn't find any at all, but I could come back and check and see if Carol or Jeff had added anything um, and get an up-to-date up communication from them, uh, which, was, which was really good. I was looking forward to logging onto iRecord and seeing, seeing what other people had managed to do. Some mysteries still. Um, were they just under-recorded until recently when we started to kind of flesh out the map? Um, have they been expanding their range or has there been a recent increase in numbers that would account for the change in the, in the recording? Um, we can only guess, really. I would say, yes, they were definitely under-recorded. Don't know if they're expanding their range and probably there's been a recent increase in numbers. The Lothian borders gap is a real mystery. Looking forward to kind of experimenting further with that. Are they present on D side? They're certainly excellent oakwoods, but is it too far north? And what time of day do females lay eggs? Personally, I haven't actually knowingly seen a female in the wild. I see the males holding territories um, in the evening. The females must be active, flying around, laying eggs much more discreetly. Maybe that happens during the day. I, I don't know. So that's certainly a mystery to me. And, and do they lay eggs on sessile oak? I, I've picked up plenty of purple street eggs off um, pedunculant oak, but I personally haven't from sessile oak. So we be interested to see if other people manage to report eggs on sessile oak. Uh, do, do they need ants for, pu for pupation? Do they, do they pupate in, in um, ant colonies, in ants' nests? Um, but how much difference does ants make to the success of the population and, their, and uh, the, the, the pupa, which is where they are most vulnerable? That's where most of the population is lost when, they, when the pupa are predated. So it would be interesting to know about whether ants are, are essential to, their, to, the, to the health of their population. And do, do, do they avoid very old oaks? There's some areas of Scotland that have truly ancient oaks, um, but we don't have purple hair street records for those. And Cadzow, certainly in, in near Glasgow, that's uh, well within the range, but there doesn't seem to be purple hair streaks on what you would think would be ideal oak trees. So finally, yes, just thanks. It's been a big community effort. Um, so these are some of the people who have been corresponding with and been sharing photos and posts and information. Um, so just want to kind of, I'm not going to read out all these people, but it's uh, just a list just to show how many people have been involved in this project. So that's been one of the fun parts of it is just getting to know lots more people and sharing information. Um, really kind of uh, appreciated help from everybody. And finally, yeah, just anybody who'd like to get more involved next year, feel free to get in touch. That's my email address and I'd be happy to hear from more people. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. That was a great update. Well done. Um, I'm just going to echo what Jim Asher said in the comments that's really inspiring that you've collected that much data or inspired a group of people to collect that much data in such a short period of time. Amazing work. Um, we have run over a little bit, but um, I'm sure people won't mind because it was a very popular talk and I have a lot of questions in the chat box. So let's start off with one from Kirsty Menzies, who says that she has found some purple hair streak eggs on windfall oak twigs this autumn and would like to try rearing them. Any tips on doing this would be hugely appreciated. Yes, yeah, so I've got plenty of tips on that. It might be worth getting in touch and I can kind of explain how I do it. But um, yeah, the trickiest part is the, is the first part when they first hatch. They're very, very tiny, very, very easy to lose them. So the trick is to kind of get them transferred from a, an old dead oak bud onto a fresh oak bud. Um, make a hole in the oak bud, 
uh, to, just to help them and then they'll kind of they'll burrow in and then quite often you just don't see them for a while and you just have to hope that you'll see them again once they've once they've kind of hollowed out the oak wood they'll emerge as a, as a bigger caterpillar and then it's just a question of yeah keeping them fed uh, is the trick but yeah it's that first step is a tricky bit to make sure you don't lose them when they're one and a half millimeters in length great and a question from sarah you know saying you know of any altitudinal limitations uh, no, we, we do know, uh, Carol managed to find them up in the Angus Glens, uh, which is probably quite high. Um, I think it's probably more that there's less oak habitat at high altitudes, you know, obviously there's a lot of moorland at high altitudes, so I would say that's probably more of a factor, uh, the fact that there's no oaks up on the on the, the kind of the hills than, than the actual altitude itself, as I guess. Um, but yeah, that, that would be my guess. Okay. Um... Ian Rippey asks, I would be interested to know what is the smallest area of habitat that purple hair streaks have been seen on in Scotland? In one or two areas here in Western Ireland, I have found viable purple hair streak populations in woods with only six to 12 oak trees. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, purple hair streaks could survive on a single oak. Uh, certainly they do down south. Um, wh whether that's kind of a, a long-term viable population on a single oak or whether it's part of a metapopulation or you know, effectively a sink where they've spread from somewhere else. Uh, I guess that's an open question, but yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I would say a single oak probably in the right conditions could support a population. Okay. And another one from Ian. Um, it seems to be well established that purple hair streaks are most active between late afternoon and early evening. Uh, but I've never heard an explanation of why this should be so. Perhaps Chris or Martin have a theory. Um, no, I have no idea. <laughs> no, it's uh, Martin. It's... Want to chip in at all? Well, I, I can only think that it's a, a mating strategy because um, they often occur, as we've heard, sort of in remote places and probably at quite low densities over big areas. So if they have an activity period where the females can find the males um on and they're often congregating on i don't know if you found this um where on sort of south facing kind of sides of trees in sheltered positions so the females have a place to go where they can't might hitch up with the male but it's a good idea if the males are there at the same time rather than flying around in the canopies at low densities where they probably don't meet each other so that would be my guess, but I, uh, yeah, fascinating piece of research for someone. Difficult. <laughs> so once again, thank you very much, Chris, for that excellent talk. So next up, uh, if you're a new volunteer, it's very likely that our next speaker had something to do with it. It's our brilliant Anthony McCluskey here to tell you about upcoming opportunities. Uh, yeah, and so I'd just like to introduce some of the things you could be doing this winter, and we've got so much on, um, and I just want to let you know about it. Um, and if you want to get in touch about any of these opportunities, this is the address. It's just our Scotland at butterfly-conservation.org address. And after today, we'll be sending an email out with all of these opportunities in it. But if you see anything today that you want to get involved in, just jot it down, and, and hopefully whenever we send you an email, it'll uh, ring a bell. Um, you can get involved. So my project is the Help Enhance for Butterflies project. A large part of that is around creating urban meadows for butterflies and parks across central Scotland. This is a photograph from just before COVID when we were all able to get out together and manage some of these sites. And the sites are doing really well now. This particular site in the photo is at Silvernoise Park in Edinburgh and it's got 15 species of butterfly recorded at it now, which are breeding there, including small skipper and now wall brown as well. So some of the sites are doing really well. So if you're in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Hamilton, Blantyre or Lennox Town, we'd love you to get involved in that. And some of the things will include um, planting wildflower plug plants um, and monitoring the sites. So do get in touch with me about that. And this is another one of the sites at Elder Park in Glasgow. And as you can see, it's doing pretty well. And as Epiphany mentioned earlier, we've had some great news about the bog squad um, and our bog work is really important, both for the species which are found in it, but because of climate change as well, because these bogs hold so much carbon in it. So we're delighted that the project is now funded for two and a half years. Those work parties will be starting from December onwards in central Scotland. So whenever that starts up, we'll be in touch to, um, to tell you how you can take part. But again, register your interest now and the project officer will be in touch when that begins. 
And much of the work that's been done in Highland and around Scotland to maintain the best sites for butterflies might look a lot like this. So we're taking out scrub and taking out gorse and birch and things like that whenever they're threatening the sites where butterflies breed. So you might have a, a hard day of work, but you'll be well rewarded, especially if you go to one of Dr. Tom Prescott's work parties where they're very well known for their uh, competitive bake-offs. Um, and that's really a, a large part of it is the social element of all of these things. So if you've never been out to a work party before, we'd love to welcome you along and you can get involved helping butterflies and meeting some like-minded people. So in Highland, we've got some of the work to conserve the rarest species of butterflies and moths in the entire UK. So things like the small blue and the dark bordered beauty. These are just some of the work parties um, taking place very soon. So in Glen Feshi later this month, Saturday the 16th, Sunday the 30th of October, um, there'll be two work parties there. In RSPB Inch Marshes near, uh, near Canusi, that's on Wednesday, 20th of October. And then there's Logie Quarry near, between Alness and Tain, which is um, Saturday, 6th of November and Sunday, 20th of November. So if you happen to jot any of those down, then that's great. Um, but we will be in touch after today to remind you of those and hopefully you'll come along and help Tom and the volunteers out. Tom's also gone under the borders for, um, for some work parties as well to help the Northern Brown Argus. This is a site um, just near Gala Shields, which is an old uh, railway cutting. And there they'll be doing removal of shrubs and small trees, um, which are beginning to shelter out the low growing wildflowers and sunny spaces that the Northern Brown Argus needs. So those are actually next week. So definitely one for the diary if you're feeling enthused from today, get involved in them. That's the 9th and 10th of October. Um, and Tom will be there with volunteers. Those all run from 10 o'clock until four, but you're welcome to attend for as long as you're able to help. So if you can only help in the morning or afternoon, you'd still be very welcome to come along to those. And then one of the ones that I'm running is at Tense Muir National Nature Reserve, a beautiful nature reserve in North Fife. We'll be creating a more exposed sand and sunny sites for species like the grayling butterfly and lunar yellow, um, lunar yellow underwing moth. Um, mostly that will be um, not scrub control, it's more about raking and removing vegetation such as grass and moss, which is taking over some of those sites. That's been confirmed for Tuesday the 23rd of November, and we might have another one next year if we need to have another one there. There's other sites we're going to be working on, um, which have dates to be confirmed. We'll be doing Falin Bing near Stirling, Kings Hill Local Nature Reserve near Shots, and Kelton Hill and Hollywood Park in Edinburgh. So do keep an eye for those coming into your inbox. We'd love you to come along and help out. Um, now, recording and monitoring butterflies is so important. That's how we can know that our butterfly populations are changing. We use lots of records, but behind all those records are a team of volunteers who are helping to do things like the, the county recorders or the transect, um, transect coordinators. They're a vital link between the local recorders and your national records database. They can, uh, volunteers check the records, ensuring good quality data reaches us for analysis. So we got some current vacancies in Glasgow and South West Branch, including Dumfries and Galloway, Brent Fisher and Inverclyde, Arran and Clyde Islands and Isla and Jura. So if you're around any of those areas and you think you'd like to have a go with this, do let us know and we can give you training and support to help you become a, a vital link in, in the, um, these recording schemes. Our transect coordinators are really important as well. Um, so these transects, um, as you'll see, for example, Southern England is very overrepresented with transects and there are huge parts of Scotland which are under monitored. So especially in Highland, um, we need a new transect coordinator for there. A transect coordinator basically acts as a first point of contact. If somebody gets in touch wanting to do a transect, the transect coordinator helps them to find one and helps them get set up with it. And we'll provide training to help you do that. We also need one for Ayrshire, Renfrewshire, um, and I'll be running training workshops um, all winter to help new people do that. So if you're interested, do let me know and um, we'll take it from there. And I'll also be offering more training for a small number of volunteers to help with our three Scottish branches. This work is more important than ever as we take on the new um, strategy for butterfly conservation. And some of those key roles are in events. So if you can attend events to promote butterfly conservation or lead guided walks, or even do school visits, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and events coordinators, these are people who might update the events listings on the web page, promote events through social media and adverts, and really just keep the whole show on the road. So if you're interested in any, in any of those in anywhere in Scotland, do let me know. And you could be taking part in things like this. You could be going to things like the Highland Show or Gardening Scotland or any of those, even local shows and fairs. We'll give you all the materials for them. 
We can give you materials to run guided walks or moth traps, and just really to enthuse the public with uh, about butterflies and moths. We'd love you. Uh, we'd love to help you reach more people that way. So I'm just going to finish up now by saying you can find out more about any of those by emailing our Scotland email address. Um, but we will be emailing after today with all of these again, just as a reminder to help you get involved. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'll can take any questions if there are any. Thanks, Anthony. I don't think there are any questions. Um, no, I can't see any. Um, because we're short on time, I would suggest that people just email Anthony directly with any questions that they have uh, about events. Uh, please do get involved. I know especially uh, I'm going to plug East Branch here and say we're super keen to get some people to help us run events and visit school children. So it'd be great if you could uh, help us out with that. All training will be provided. Okay, great. So we're ending today's gathering in the usual, usual fashion uh, with a roundup of highlights from Tom Prescott. Over to you, Tom. Yes, so uh, thank you, Epiphany. Yes, um, I seem to get landed with this every year. Um, so what I do and Shona do is that we uh, send an email around all our vice county and regional butterfly and moth recorders, and they then inundate me with what they consider are the highlights. And then I have uh, what I consider a difficult job to try and condense those down into this sort of wee presentation. And of course, um, I will leave, have to leave lots and lots of things out because the amount of information I get is phenomenal. So uh, this is very much a sort of personal choice. So apologies before I begin, if I've not included what you would consider a real highlight for 2021. And also apologies if I uh, get your names wrong, the, the sites names wrong um, and any, any other information wrong. That's entirely my fault. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so let, let's start. 2021. Um, well, my recollections is that we had a superb winter, certainly up here in the Cairngorms, large amounts of snow, um, you know, what winters should be in Scotland. But uh, the trouble was that winter didn't really know when to finish. Um, and our spring was very, very late in coming. Um, and very, very low catches in the moth trap, uh, certainly in April and into May. Um, and uh, the, similarly, a lot of our butterflies were very late in emerging during the spring. But slowly and steadily, um, I think that the butterflies and moths caught up with the books and they were coming out as they should. And I think we had a phenomenal summer, probably one of the best summers I can remember in Scotland. Normally, when I ask for highlights, I get lots of grumpy emails saying, oh, the weather, it was too cold, it was too wet, um, we've not seen very much. Um, but that, I hardly got anything like that uh, at all this year. So there were lots of, certainly in the moth traps, later in the summer. So, for instance, Graham Crittenden, who lives up in the far northwest of Scotland um, in the, in, on the 8th of September, he caught 100 black rustic and 350 ear moths in a single moth trap. And that was certainly my experience that the middle, late summer, early autumn, large, large numbers of, of, of moths in traps, which was uh, superb. Um, the top contributor, as always, when it comes to moths is Nigel, Nigel Voden. And on the 16th of July, in his uh, garden, he ran two traps, one in the front garden, one in the back garden, um, fairly modest garden. This is in Burnt Island. Um, he recorded a phenomenal 135 different species of moth on one night in his wee small garden. More than that, he also ran a trap nearby in a friend's garden on the same night and caught 101 different species. That's 101 different species of moth in a single trap. Combined on that night, that was over, a, that was 160 moths. So that is just, uh, you know, unbelievable. Um, yes, so, so yeah, top marks for Nigel. Now I'll start off on the, on the butterflies. Um, let's start with green veined white. Where, top left, where were all the green veined whites this year? 
I hardly saw any at all. Normally you're going out into the countryside and there's green veined whites everywhere. I hardly saw any green veined whites. So these really seem to have had a, had a crash. Again, painted ladies. Um, I think I only saw one painted lady. Um, if we go bottom left to the comma, commas are still expanding, certainly here in the highlands. Uh, I've, I've seen a number in there, I've seen one in the garden for, for two or three weeks. Um, they were uh, Audrey Turner, who is the moth recorder for Murray, actually reported that she's received more records of comma from Murray than painted ladies. So it's good to know that, that commas are still on the increase. And the other great surprise to me was small pearl bordered fritillary, bottom right. You look in your butterfly books and you see that down south they get second generations of uh, species like this. And you think, well, that's never going to happen in Scotland. But uh, Hillary, Pete Moore's uh, wife, Hillary, known locally as Hillary Fritillary, um, she had records of second or three records of second brood small pearl bordered fritillaries from the highlands. I mean, that just goes to show what a wonderful uh, late summer we had so that the small, small pearl bordered fritillary was able to have a second generation, admittedly just very few, um, up here in the highlands this year. Moving on to a, a few more different species. Um, where else should we start? Speckled wood continues to expand, doing very, very well in Stirlingshire, again doing very well in, in Murray, still expanding in Highland, so doing very well, which is uh, good to know, so that, that's speckled wood. Um, there were um, the ringlet again is also expanding. I reported last year of them moving for the first time and being seen in the far northwest of Scotland and also in Caithness. Well, the reports are that they are still there. Um, and also wall butterfly has, has been doing remarkably well. Um, particularly last year, we, we mentioned about them uh, moving into Fife with large numbers of them in Fife. Well, that's continued to move in Fife and move further up the coast with some you know, very large numbers seen. And also Dingy Skipper, um, good numbers seen certainly in around here in Straths Bay. Uh, last year, there was a report of two or three at a new site near Boat of Garton. Pete and Hillary went there this year and recorded 82 uh, at that same site. So Dingy Skipper seems to have had a, a very good year. Um, now on to marsh fritillary. Um, in Scotland, marsh fritillary is known primarily from the sort of Argyll coast. It's also on Butte, but also some of the neighbouring islands like Jura and particularly Isla and Mull. But last year I reported a sighting on the 2nd of June near Lockerbie, down in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, it was very unclear where those butterflies had come from. There's been a recent uh, reintroduction program in Cumbria where the butterflies there have been doing well and have been expanding. So was this an overlooked native Scottish population or was it uh, part of that Cumbria release program and the butterflies had sort of moved north of the border? What's interesting with that uh, release is that uh, they released uh, the, the butterfly, but they didn't release its parasitoid. So going by um, Martin's calculation, uh, without any predation, because uh, the parasitic wasps are one of the main things that parasitize and predate on marsh fritillary, it's not surprising perhaps that uh, the Cumbrian population has done so well. So I suspect that uh, the Lockerbie population uh, probably comes from Cumbria. Will we ever know? Well, we might know because students at Edge Hill University in Liverpool uh, a few years ago came up to Scotland and sampled uh, um, caterpillars and extracted the DNA from a number of the populations um, in Scotland. They did the same in England and Wales, and they've now sampled uh, the DNA from this uh, population near Lockerbie. Um, uh, we don't yet have the results, but that should be able to tell us the origins of this uh, this new population. So the butterflies have been found in four locations near Lockerbie. As I say, they were first reported in 2020. 
Uh, this year, there were over 90 adults found in total and about 110 webs. So it's a very strong population. Of those, about 80% of them were at one site. So it's really good to know that this butterfly is sort of beginning to establish in southwest Scotland. Uh, brimstone, I mean, I was very, very surprised by this news because when you look at the distribution map of, brim, of brimstone, it seems to get up into Scotland just on the border and never quite, uh, you know, jump over the border to become a proper Scottish butterfly. Um, so in all the years I've lived in Scotland, I've never known of a, of a single report or a genuine report of brimstone uh, in, in north of the border. But here is photographic proof. This is a photograph by Abby Marland of a, um, of a brimstone. And in fact, there were three records all in East Lothian all over the summer at the end of July to the uh, beginning of August, sorry, end of July to the end of August, seen by Abbey. Ian uh, Ebbage had one in Haddington, George Hogg had one in Skateroar, and this one of Abbey's is in Coates. So with three um, adults being seen in a relatively sort of a, a small part of Scotland, um, the food plant is older buckthorn. So if there's older buckthorn in the area, maybe brimstone will become a, a Scottish butterfly. What about this wonderful photo? This is uh, taken by Mark Tasker in Bankery. Um, what, do you, what does everybody think this is? Um, luckily, with such a wonderful, sharp photograph, we can identify it as an Essex skipper. But when we look at the distribution map, you'll see that he found he photographed this in his back garden in Bankery. So Bankery is right up here where my arrow is. So what is a butterfly like this doing up in Bankery? Now, not only did he just see one butterfly, he recorded Essex skippers between the 7th and 16th of August with a peak of seven on one day, all in a very small area, 100 metres square. So that's an area of 10 metres by 10 metres. Now, Essex skipper is a, a grass feeding butterfly. That's what the caterpillars are feeding on. Um, and it is known to have been transported in fodder, either as eggs or as caterpillars. You'll see this other single dot in Scotland, which is near Dumfries. Um, that a small colony of Essex skippers appeared there soon after the foot and mouth outbreak. And it was thought that they came in on fodder uh, that was feeding all the animals because there was a huge sort of cremation site there. So presumably the same has happened up in Bankery. Uh, the butterflies also, was also introduced into America many years ago on fodder. So it, this is probably the, the way that the butterfly has found its way to Bankery. Uh, Mark became a detective, the Miss Marple of Bankery, and uh, he went round his uh, local farmers. Uh, there were a number of uh, uh, people who had ponies uh, nearby, so he was asking people where they brought their fodder from, and virtually all of them it was local. So he ruled uh, that out as a uh, way that the, the butterfly had got there. But that very close to him, there was a local new housing development. And the theory is, is that people bringing in plants, perhaps turfing their gardens, uh, brought in this uh, butterfly on um, eggs or as larvae. So uh, will the butterfly be able to survive the uh, Bankley winter? Well, we'll probably have to wait for Mark to tell us next year. Also, you'll see the red circle there. That's the way to identify um, the difference between Essex skipper and small skipper. So Essex skipper here has a black end to the underside of its antennae. So very difficult to see in the field, but with such a wonderful sharp photograph, um, easier to tell. So quite a remarkable finding. And similarly with the gatekeeper, um, this not a, really a Scottish butterfly. This was found and recorded in Inverurie. So what's happening in, uh, in Aberdeenshire um, on the 22nd of July by Diane Sorry. So um, maybe a similar origin to the Essex skipper, maybe it had been transported up on, on food or fodder because the caterpillars are also uh, grass feeders. 
So a bit of a mystery, but it's quite interesting to see that if you keep your eyes peeled and you're going out, that you can see these um, you know, unusual species, maybe of uh, a fairly um, difficult to determine their origin, but uh, you know you can find dif different species, and there's uh, there's the gatekeeper to show that um, yes, it uh, it's probably been brought in um, crossing the border um, way up into Inveruri, um, you know, artificially with some type of a human help. Now it's not very often you'd get excited about a butterfly like this. This is uh, small. Um, white. But if you lived in Shetland, then you would. This is the first confirmed record of small white in Shetland. Um, also, Graham Crittenden in the, the, the west, uh, in northwest uh, Sutherland. Um, this is his photograph of one he caught in his garden. And this is the first reliable record of small white in that far north in Scotland. So uh, yes, a, a, an exciting local find in both uh, instances. I'm now going to quickly go over to the dark side and uh, go and talk about some of the moth records. And again, we're back in Shetland. This is a wormwood trapped by Gordon Waddle on the 7th of August. Um, the very first Scottish record. Um, Paul Harvey, who sent me details of uh, this sighting, he thinks that uh, with the other migrants that were around, the other birds that the birds that were around at the same time, that this is probably of Scandinavian origin. So it's probably blown in from the east rather than uh, an immigrant that's come up from south. So uh, a remarkable find, Wormwood, the first uh, genuine Scottish record uh, in Shetland. The other thing that Paul said was that uh, it's very encouraging the number of new people getting into butterflies and moths in Shetland. Last year he just had five regular trappers, this year he had 15. So a three-fold uh, increase in recorders or regular recorders in Shetland. Now this, this is very uh, apt um, given David's wonderful talk about uh, the clear wings in the borders. This was a photograph that came to our attention that was on Twitter. It was recorded on the 17th of July. Uh, somebody was walking along the uh, sculpture trail, Forestry and Land Scotland's uh, sculpture trail in Loch Ard uh, near the Trossachs, uh, a lass called Laura. Now, um, if this was sent to me, I would think, well, in that part of Scotland at uh, that time of year, it's, uh, it's probably going to be a Welsh clearing, but I mean, it looks a little bit odd. Uh, there's a Welsh clearing on the right. It's lacking the sort of orangey tail, but yes, it looks a little bit worn. It looks a little bit tatty. Um, it was found remarkably without lures. I mean, David really highlighted how elusive uh, clear wings are. So if you don't have one of these wonderful lures, um, you know, you're really not going to see them. So was this just a very lucky observation of a Welsh clearing um, in close to its sort of known area? But if you look at the uh, photograph clearly, you will see that the markings don't quite match up with Welsh clearing. So was it this species on the right? This is current clearing. David mentioned current clearing and the only um, current records we have of current clearing are from Melrose, although the, the moth hasn't been seen there for a, a few years, two or three years. But again, it's not quite current clearing. Remarkably, this is a white barred clearing. I mean, it's even very unusual down south. There are, the nearest old records are from the Lake District, Otherwise, you're in the sort of the, the Midlands, in the sort of, um, where, it, where the, the, the nearest currently known um, populations of this moth are. Now, what's interesting is that this it has a similar habitat to Welsh clearing. Welsh clearing larvae live uh, a bit like a red belted clearing inside living birch trees. Um, they, they, their presence is portrayed by small exit holes, and this does exactly the same on alder as well as birch. So it will be really interesting to go to this area next year with a lure, because you can get a lure for white barred clearwing, 
um, and see how widespread this uh, the, the population is. And you see one other way, one way to identify it as well is you see that it's got these white ends to the antennae. This, uh, over the season, I was running a number of uh, virtual workshops. I did one on clear wings and I included all the Scottish clear wings, plus a few that I thought might be overlooked and might pop over the border, but I didn't even think to consider including white barred clear wing. So a remarkable find. While we're still on clear wings, this is a Welsh clear wing recorded for the first time on Mull which is very exciting. This is Chris Ostick, who also recorded the uh, purple hair streak that Chris mentioned on Mull. He's become a very, very active and very uh, good uh, butterfly and moth recorder on Mull. Not only did he find Welsh clearwing, he found lunar hornet moth and large red belted clearwing. All these three uh, clearwings were to lures, all on Mull, and all of them were first records for Mull. And you can see there, you know, the significance of those uh, those records. Alan Skeets, who's the uh, wonderful uh, moth recorder on the island, also reported that there were two additional macros seen on Mull for the first time, and also nine micros. And 90% of those records were from Chris, from Chris Ostick. So, um, yes, well, well done, Chris. Now I'm going to do a wee section on hawk moths. This is convolvulus hawk moth. Um, if we get a decent autumn with lots of uh, immigrants and uh, people are growing lots of Natikiana um, tobacco plants, then we've all got a good chance of finding convolvulus hawk moth in our gardens. It's not been a particularly good year so far for them, but the season isn't yet over. This one was uh, from VC88 near Dunning on the 20th of September, recorded by Arthur Bruce, and it's the first Vice County record since uh, 1904. Um, in Shetland, there's been eight records so far, and there's been one or two elsewhere in Scotland. This is the only death's head hawk moth that's so far uh, come to my attention. This was in Strontian. Um, in West Inverness, recorded on the 29th of August. Uh, it was actually found inside somebody's house um, and they, uh, they took some photos, they released it, and then it flew straight back in the house down the chimney. Um, so obviously uh, it was very, very, felt very at home in the, in the house. So as I say, that's the only record. Now this uh, wonderful photograph by Norman Tate is from 2016. Uh, we're a pair of lime hawk moths found mating on a lime tree in Renfrew in Glebe Street on the 27th of May 2016. At the time it was uh, thought that perhaps somebody had been breeding them and they'd been released. A caterpillar was then found nearby in 2019, um, which was then suggestive that uh, perhaps uh, a, you know, a population had become established or perhaps it was an overlooked population. Well, this year, um, at the end of May, a lady called Kate in Ralston near Paisley was uh, doing a bit of gardening and trimming some bushes and, she, and she's got two lime trees in her garden and she came across this uh, adult. Um, also, uh, I was sent uh, by Scott Donaldston a video of a lime hawk moth uh, caterpillar in uh, feeding on limes and it was uh, it was wandering from a lime tree presumably finding somewhere to pupate at Corpus Christi school so this is sort of further evidence that in that part of, uh, of Glasgow and Paisley that perhaps there is now a resident population of lime hawks and what about this stunner oleander hawk moth uh, recorded on the 12th of September by Chris Wilson, whose photograph this is as well. Um, very few Scottish records that, that there were, they're only on the um, larger moth atlas of uh, Britain and Ireland. There's only three post 10 kilometer squares uh, since 2000 in Scotland for this wonderful, wonderful, fantastic uh, hawk moth. So this was in, in Shetland. But uh, what about this? This caterpillar was found. Now, this is slightly old news in that this was recorded in 2020. It came to our attention earlier in the summer. Um, it 
was on iNaturalist. And this was recorded by a guy called Henry McBeath on the 21st of July, 24th of July, 2020, uh, on the west coast of Scotland, very close to Gairlock. You can see Gairlock here. Um, it's just found to the south of Gairlock, so in a fairly remote area. This is, in fact, willow herb hawk moth. There have only ever been two British records, one from Sussex in 1985, one uh, found in the docks in East London in 1995. Um, intriguing to know where this, the origins of this caterpillar um, in such a you know, relatively remote part of Scotland. The caterpillars feed primarily on willow herb, as the name suggests, but also evening, evening primrose. Has it been brought in somehow? Um, there's no sort of local garden centre there. Um, I've been trying to track down Henry McBeath, and as you saw earlier today, that I'm pretty poor and hopeless on my tech, and I don't really do things like Facebook, but I have found Henry McBeath on Facebook, and I have messaged him, but so far I've not had a response. So if anybody knows a Henry McBeath, um, we'd be really keen for him to get in touch to try and find more out more about this, uh, you know, remarkable sighting. And is it really genuine? Was it really recorded in this part of Scotland? Um, or um, yes, yes. So very, very um, yeah, intriguing, very intriguing indeed. Willow herb hawk moth. And if that caterpillar survived and pupated, this is the wonderful adult that it would be, adult willow herb hawk moth. Slender burnished brass. Um, there's a nice wee story about this. Uh, a student called uh, Ardiana Nella uh, went into their local Tesco's in Argyle Street in Glasgow and bought some herbs. I mean, that's remarkable itself um, because Ardiana was a student. You know, what are students buying herbs for? Never happened back, back in my day. Um, and on those herbs, she found some caterpillar. She found a caterpillar. She brought it home. Uh, within a week or so, it pupated. And this is what it turned into, a slender burnished brass. Um, so obviously, it's got here under sort of false pretenses, as it were, but still uh, a very rare moth. And yes, a, a, a nice photo, something to, to look out for. But a, a very there's about a, a hundred uh, natural migrants uh, arrive in Britain or have arrived in Britain, uh, but never any yet uh, naturally into Scotland. Uh, also on the immigrant um, theme, four spotted footmen, there's been a number of records of four spotted footmen. Um, there, certainly it was arrived in Caithness, there was one seen in East Ross. Uh, Catty Baird had one in Binning in East Lothian on the 4th of August, and as I say, there were a number of others elsewhere. So a nice moth to see, one of the, the larger of the footmen. Uh, now into the borders, uh, red underwing on the left-hand side. Uh, last year, there were a couple seen in Berwickshire, VC81. And this is another one that's turned up. Uh, this is from Richard Jackson, the caterpillars feed on willow and poplar and aspen. Um, so does this suggest that there is now a resident population? White satin was also recorded in the borders. Uh, this one was in late July. It's a very rare moth um, and it was uh, to to totally unexpected. And it was the first record in the borders since 1877. So another aspen feeder. And this was uh, seen by Nick Cook. And you can see there that, um, you know, there's only one or two other dots in Scotland. So a species that may be just uh, crossing the border um, and maybe becoming established uh, there. And dusky lemon sallow. This is a, this moth. Its caterpillars feed on elm, so it has really suffered with Dutch elm disease. Um, but it may be there may be signs this year that it's making a wee recovery. It was recorded. It used to be recorded widely across Berwickshire in the fifties. Um, and there were records in, there was a record in 1984 and 2006, and then Richard Jackson recorded one this year. Um, and similarly around Bannockburn, there's been records and in Bridge of Allen. So there seems to be a, a wee populations in, in that part of Stirlingshire as well, with records by uh, David Bryant, 
uh, in, in particular. So uh, dusky lemon sallow. And you can see here that it's a scarce moth in Scotland, but uh, the, the older yellower circles show that it was formerly far more widespread before 2000, but it's encouraging that there's a few black dots on there, but also a few blue ones indicating that uh, the moth has been found in 2017. And scallop shell, um, particularly scarce moth uh, in the borders. This is only the third record for the borders. Um, it seems to be doing quite well elsewhere. Always a lovely moth to find in your trap. Um, but uh, the, the nice thing about this story with this moth is that it was caught by Thomas McLeish. Uh, he's only 13 um, and he's only just getting into moths. And what's more exciting was that he caught this himself in his own moth trap that he built. So uh, well done, Thomas, and a, yeah, a fantastic moth. Uh, due to uh, COVID, uh, Mike Taylor, who is the moth recorder for uh, Murray in East Invernessia, he normally disappears for several weeks on end, particularly going to Scandinavia, to Sweden. But because of COVID, he's been staying at home and he's been doing more trips in Scotland. And as a result, this moth, Gypnosoma oppressana, um, he recorded in Strathclyde Country Park on the 10th of June. And this is the very, very first record of this moth in Scotland. Um, it feeds on popular. He put his, his uh, moth trap under a hybrid popular and presumably that was the origin of where this moth had came, come from. Now, how about this? this? This is a gruesome photo of a ghost moth caterpillar that's been infected by a fungus. Now, this is uh, quite an unusual thing to find in the wild, but there's over a hundred uh, fungi that uh, uh, infect caterpillars like this and solely kill them off. They're in the group um, Cordyceps. And here's an enlarged photo of that poor caterpillar. Now, this caterpillar was found in, in for all places, Cambus Lang, by uh, a lady called Leonie de Vert in mid-March 2021. She was doing some gardening and she found this caterpillar like this just in her garden. Um, it was posted on the Glasgow Natural History Group. It got uh, into the hands of a guy called Nigel Hewell Jones, who then took samples of the um, fungus. He grew it in culture in the lab, and then he realized that it was new to science. So this is a, a caterpillar killing fungus found in Cambus Lang that is new to science. And you can see its scientific name there. Uh, I won't try and pronounce it, but it's nice to see that Le the, the second part of the name, the Leonie, is uh, in recognition of the finder, um, which is like Leonie de Vert. And finally, um, this is the world's smallest moth. This is a very small leaf miner that makes these very distinctive uh, spiral mines in um, sorrel, in sheep sorrel. And this was found by my colleague, George Tordoff. He found it on Mull and he found it in West Invernessia when he was up on holiday this summer. Both are new records for the Vice County. And I'm sure it's more widespread. Um, so please get out there and look for it. The mines will be present through most of the summer, probably into the autumn. And they're very, very distinctive. So that was gonna be it until uh, Malcolm Lindsay sent me this uh, image. While in the middle of today's um, program, this is a Clifton Nonpareil or a blue underway, underwing caught this morning by Nick Cook in Denham in the borders. So a very exciting find and I think very apt to uh, end uh, my wee presentation. So thank you all for listening um, and thanks to all, everybody who got in touch and thank you for all the photographs and apologies if, if I've not uh, acknowledged anybody or got anything wrong, which I'm sure I have. So thank you. Thanks, Tom. Great roundup, as always, and so interesting about those uh, Essex skippers transported on fodder. Really, really interesting. I don't think you have any questions. Um, lots of people uh, saying how much they've enjoyed the talks in the chat. But yeah, I think you're, uh, you've got off lightly today. No questions. Good. 
<laughs> so to round up today's gathering, I'd like to say a huge thank you to our excellent speakers and to you, the audience, for giving up your Saturday to join us. I really hope you enjoyed the talks and we'll hope to see you soon at one of our events. Special thanks to Anthony McCluskey for taking care of the tech side of things and doing his best to keep us on track. We always have a really interesting lineup of speakers, but I have to say I loved that today there was a big emphasis on action. We've heard suggestions about where to look for species and we've been invited to a whole number of different activities. We've also had a great dose of inspiration to remind us just how extraordinary the life cycle of butterflies really is. I hope you feel inspired and I hope you engage with us on social media in the following months. Please do send us photos of what you get up to. We'd love to see them. The nights may be drawing in and there's a definite chill in the air, but there is still plenty to do. So for now, wrap up warm, have a lovely weekend, and we'll see you soon.